Preface of Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Kilpatrick. Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds by Bernard Lebovier de Fontenelle. Translated by William Gardner. Monsieur Fontenelle's Preface. I am pretty much in the case of Cicero when he undertook to write a philosophy in his own tongue, there being then no books upon that subject but what were written in Greek. He was told, as he informed us, that he would take pains to no purpose, because such as were admirers of philosophy would make use of Greek authors, and not read Latin ones, which treated of it but at second hand, and those who had no such relish for this science would never trouble their heads with either Greek or Latin. Cicero replied, it might happen quite otherwise, for, says he, the great ease people will find in reading Latin books will tempt those to be philosophers who are none, and they who already are philosophers by reading Greek books will be very glad to see how the subject is handled in Latin. Cicero might with good reason answer as he did, because the excellency of his genius and the great reputation he had acquired warranted the success of all he wrote. But in a design not much unlike his, I am far from having those grounds of confidence which he had. My purpose is to discourse of philosophy, but not directly in a philosophical manner, and to raise it to such a pitch that it shall not be too dry and insipid a subject to please gentlemen, nor too mean and trifling to entertain scholars. Should I be told, as Cicero was, that such a discourse as this would not please the learned, because it can teach them nothing, nor the illiterate, because they will have no mind to learn, I will not answer as he did. It may be, endeavoring to please everybody, I have pleased nobody. Now to keep the middle betwixt two extremes is so very difficult that I believe I shall never desire to put myself a second time to the like trouble. If I should acquaint those who are to read this book and have any knowledge of natural philosophy, that I do not pretend to instruct, but only to divert them, by presenting to their view in a gay and pleasing dress what they have already seen in a more grave and solid habit. Not but they to whom the subject is new may be both diverted and instructed. The first will act contrary to my intention if they look for profit, and the second if they seek for nothing but pleasure. I have chosen that part of philosophy which is most like to excite curiosity. For I think nothing can concern us more than to inquire how this world, which we inhabit, is made, and whether there be any other worlds like it, which are also inhabited as this is. But after all, tis at everybody's discretion how far they will run their disquisitions. They who have any thoughts to lose may throw them away upon such subjects as these, but I suppose such as can spend their time better will not be at so vain and fruitless an expense. In these discourses, I have introduced a lady to be instructed in things of which she never heard, and I have made use of this fiction to render the book the more acceptable, and to give encouragement to gentlewomen by the example of one of their own sex, who without any supernatural parts or tincture of learning understands what is said to her, and without any confusion rightly apprehends what vortexes and other worlds are. And why may not there be a woman like this imaginary countess, since her conceptions are no other than such as she could not choose but have. To penetrate into things either obscure in themselves or but darkly expressed requires deep meditation and an earnest application of the mind. But here nothing more is requisite than to read and to imprint an idea of what is read in the fancy, which will certainly be clear enough. I shall desire no more of the fair sex than that they will peruse this system of philosophy with the same application that they do a romance or novel when they would retain the plot or find out all its beauties. Tis true that the ideas of this are less familiar to most ladies than those of romances, but they are not more obscure, for at most twice or thrice thinking will render them very perspicuous. I have not composed an airy system which has no foundation at all. I have made use of some true philosophical arguments, and of as many as I thought necessary, but it falls out very luckily in this subject that the physical ideas are in themselves very diverting, 
and as they convince and satisfy reason so at the same time they present to the imagination a prospect which looks as if it were made on purpose to please it when i meet with any fragments which are not of this kind i put them into some pretty strange dress virgil has done the like in his georgics when his subject is very dry he adorns it with pleasant digressions ovid has done the same in his art of love and though his subject be of itself very pleasing yet he thought it tedious to talk of nothing but love my subject has more need of digressions than his yet i have made use of them very sparingly and of such only as the natural liberty of conversation allows i have placed them only where i thought my readers would be pleased to meet with them the greatest part of them are in the beginning of the book because the mind cannot at first be so well acquainted with the principal ideas which are presented to it and in a word they are taken from the subject itself or are as near to it as is possible i have fancied nothing concerning the inhabitants of the many worlds which must have been wholly fabulous and chimerical i have said all that can be reasonably thought of them and the visions which i have added have some real foundation what is true and what is false are mingled together but so as to be easily distinguished i will not undertake to justify so fantastical and odd a composition which is the principal point of the work and yet for which i can give no very good reason there remains no more to be said in this preface but to a sort of people who perhaps will not be easily satisfied though i have good reasons to give them but because the best that can be given will not content them they are those scrupulous persons who imagine that the placing inhabitants anywhere but upon the earth will prove dangerous to religion i know how excessively tender some are in religious matters and therefore i am very unwilling to give any offence in what i publish to people whose opinion is contrary to that i maintain but religion can receive no prejudice by my system which fills an infinity of worlds with inhabitants if a little error of the imagination be but rectified when tis said the moon is inhabited some presently fancy that there are such men there as we are and churchmen, without any more ado, think him an atheist who is of that opinion. None of Adam's posterity ever travelled so far as the moon, nor were any colonies ever sent thither. The men, then, that are in the moon are not the sons of Adam, and here again theology would be puzzled if there should be men anywhere who never descended from him. To say no more, this is the great difficulty to which all others may be reduced. To clear it by a larger explanation, I must make use of terms which deserve greater respect than to put into a treatise so far from being serious as this is. But perhaps there is no need of answering the objection, for it concerns nobody but the men in the moon, and I never yet said there are men there. If any ask what the inhabitants there are, if they be not men, all I can say is that I never saw them, and tis not because I have seen them that I speak of them let none now think that i say there are no men in the moon purposely to avoid the objection made against me for it appears tis impossible there should be any men there according to the idea i have framed of that infinite diversity and variety which is to be observed in the works of nature this idea runs through the whole book and cannot be contradicted by any philosopher nay i believe i shall only hear this objection started by such as shall speak of these discourses without having read them but is this a point to be depended on? No, on the contrary, I should more probably fear that the objection might be made to me from many passages. The reader will find in this edition, besides many improvements interspersed in the body of the work, one new conversation in which I have put together those reasonings which I had omitted in the foregoing ones, and have subjoined some late discoveries in the firmament, several of which were never yet made public. End of Preface Recording by Michelle Kilpatrick Introduction of Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds by Bernard Lebovier de Fontenelle Translated by William Gardner This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Discourses on the Plurality of Worlds to Monsieur R. To give you, sir, as you desire, a full account how I pass my time at the Countess of D.'s country seat would make a large volume, and what is yet worse, a volume of philosophy. Whereas the entertainments you expect are of another kind, 
dancing, gaming, hunting, instead of which you must take up with vortexes, planets, and new worlds. These were the subjects of our conversation. Now, as good luck would have it, you're a philosopher, so that it will be no great disappointment. Nay, I fancy you'll be pleased that I have brought over the countess to our party. We could not have gained a more considerable person, for youth and beauty are ever inestimable. If wisdom would appear with success to mankind, think you she could do it more effectually than in the person of the countess. And yet was her company but half so agreeable, I am persuaded all the world would run mad after wisdom. But though I tell you all the discourse I had with the lady, you must not expect miracles from me. It is impossible without her wit to express her sentiments in the same manner she delivered them. For my part, I think her very learned, from the great disposition she has to learning. It is not poring upon books that makes a man a scholar. I know many who have done nothing else, and yet I fancy are not one tittle the wiser. But perhaps you expect, before I enter upon my subject, I should describe the situation and building of the Countess's house. Many great palaces have been turned inside outward upon far less occasion. But I intend to save you and myself that labor. Let it suffice that I tell you I found no company with the lady which I was not at all displeased with. The two first days drained me of all the news I brought from Paris. What I now send you is the rest of our conversation, which I will divide into so many parts as we were evenings together. End of Introduction Chapter 1, Part 1 of Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds by Bernard Le Beauvier de Fontenelle Translated by William Gardner This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The first evening's conversation That the earth is a planet which turns on itself and round the sun. One evening after supper, we went to take a turn in the park. The air from the heat of the preceding day was extremely refreshing. The moon was about an hour high, and her luster between the trees made an agreeable mixture of light and shade. The stars were arrayed in all their glory, and not a cloud appeared throughout the azure sky. I was musing on this awful prospect, but who can think long of the moon or stars in the company of a pretty woman? I am much mistaken if that's a time for contemplation. Well, madam, says I to the countess, is not the night as pleasant as the day? The day, says she, like a fair beauty is clear and dazzling, but the night, like a brown beauty, more soft and moving. You are generous, madam, replied I, to prefer the brown, you who have all the charms that belong to the fair. But is there anything more beautiful in nature than the day? The heroines of romances are generally fair, and that beauty must be perfect, which has all the advantages of imagination. Tell me not says she, of perfect beauty. Nothing can be so that is not moving. But since you talk of romances, why do lovers in their songs and elegies address themselves to the night? Tis the night, madam, says I, that crowns their joys, and therefore deserves their thanks. But tis the night, says she, that hears their complaints, and how comes it to pass the day is so little trusted with their secrets? I confess, madam, says I, the night has somewhat a more melancholy air than the day. We fancy the stars march more silently than the sun, and our thoughts wander with the more liberty, whilst we think all the world at rest but ourselves. Besides, the day is more uniform. We see nothing but the sun, and light in the firmament, whilst the night shews us variety of objects, and gives us ten thousand stars, which inspire us with as many pleasant ideas. She replied, what you say is true. I love the stars. There is somewhat charming in them, and I could almost be angry with the sun for effacing them. And I can't, says I, pardon him, for keeping all those worlds from my sight. What worlds? says she, looking earnestly upon me. What worlds do you mean? I beg your pardon, madam, says I. You have put me upon my folly, and I begin to rave. What folly? says she. I discover none. Alas, says I, I am ashamed, I must own it. I have had a strong fancy that every star is a world. I will not swear that it is true, 
but must think so, because it is so pleasant to believe it. Tis a fancy come into my head which is very diverting. If your folly be so diverting, says the Countess, pray make me sensible of it. Provided the pleasure be so great, I will believe as much of the stars as you would have me. A diversion, madam, says I. Tis a diversion I fear you won't relish. Tis not like one of Moliere's plays. Tis a pleasure rather of the fancy than of the judgment. I hope, replied she, you do not think me incapable of it. Teach me your stars, I will show you the contrary. No, no, replied I. It shall never be said I was talking philosophy at ten o'clock at night to the most amiable creature in the universe. Find your philosophers somewhere else. But vain were my excuses. Who could resist such charms? I was forced to yield, and yet I knew not where to begin. For to a person who understood nothing of natural philosophy, you must go a great way about to prove that the earth may be a planet, the planets so many earths, and all the stars worlds. However, to give her a general notion of philosophy, at last I resolved on this method. Madam, says I, all philosophy is founded upon these two propositions. One, that we are too short-sighted, or two, we are too curious. For if our eyes were better than they are, we should soon see whether the stars were worlds or not. And if on the other side we were less curious, we should not care whether the stars are worlds or not which I think is much to the same purpose. But the business is, we have a mind to know more than we see. And again, if we could discern well what we do see, it would be so much known to us. But we see things quite otherwise than they are, so that your true philosopher will not believe what he does see, and is always conjecturing at what he doth not, which I think is a life not much to be envied. Upon this, I fancy to myself that nature very much resembles an opera, where you stand, you do not see the stage as it really is, but as tis placed with advantage, and all the wheels and movements hid to make the representation the more agreeable. Nor do you trouble yourself how or by what means the machines are moved, though certainly an engineer in the pit is affected with what does not touch you. He is pleased with the motion and is demonstrating to himself on what it depends and how it comes to pass. This engineer is like a philosopher, though the difficulty be greater on the philosopher's part, the machines of the theatre being nothing so curious as those of nature, which disposes her wheels and springs so out of sight that we have been a long while guessing at the movement of the universe. Let us imagine some of the ancient sages to be at an opera, the Pythagoras's, the Plato's, the Aristotle's, and all the wise men who have made such a noise in the world for these many ages. We will suppose them at the representation of Phaeton, where they see the aspiring youth lifted up by the winds, but do not discover the wires by which he mounts, nor know they anything of what is done behind the scenes. Would you have all these philosophers own themselves to be stark fools, and confess ingenuously they don't know how it comes to pass? No, no, they are not called wise men for nothing, though let me tell you, most of their wisdom depends upon the ignorance of their neighbors. Every man presently gives his opinion, and how improbable soever, there are fools enough of all sorts to believe them. One tells you Phaeton is drawn up by a hidden magnetic virtue, no matter where it lies, and perhaps the grave gentleman will take pet if you ask him the question. Another says Phaeton is composed of certain numbers that make him mount, and after all, the philosopher knows no more of those numbers than a sucking child does of algebra. A third tells you Phaeton has a secret love for the top of the theater, and like a true lover, cannot be at rest out of his mistress's company, within hundred such extravagant fancies that a man must conclude the old sages were very good banterers. But now comes Monsieur Descartes, with some of the moderns, and they tell you Phaeton ascends because a greater weight than he descends, so that now we do not believe a body can move without it is pushed and forced by another body, and as it were, drawn by cords, so that nothing can rise or fall but by the means of a counterpoise. To see nature, then, as she really is, one must stand behind the scenes of the opera. I perceive, says the Countess, philosophy is now become very mechanical, Yes, madam, says I, so mechanical that I fear we shall quickly be ashamed of it. 
they will have the world to be in large what a watch is in small, which is very regular, and depends only upon the just disposing of the several parts of the movement. But pray tell me, madam, had you not formerly a more sublime idea of the universe? Don't you think you then honoured it more than it deserved? For most people have the less esteem for it since they have pretended to know it. I am not of their opinion, says she. I value it the more since I know it resembles a watch, and the more plain and easy the whole order of nature seems to be, to me it appears the more admirable. I don't know, says she, who has inspired you with these solid notions, but I am certain there are but few who have them besides yourself. People generally admire what they do not comprehend. They have a veneration for obscurity, and look upon nature as a kind of magic, while they don't understand her, and despise her below ledger domain, when once they are acquainted with her. But I find you, madam, so much better disposed, that I have nothing to do but to draw the curtain and shew you the world. That then which appears farthest from the earth where we reside is called the heavens, that azure firmament where the stars are fastened like so many nails, and are called fixed because they seem to have no other motion than that of their heaven, which carries them with itself from east to west. Between the earth and this great vault, as I may call it, hang at different heights the sun and the moon, with the other five stars, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which we call the planets, not being fastened to the same heaven, and having very unequal motions, have diverse aspects and positions. Whereas the fixed stars in respect to one another are always in the same situation, for example, Charles's wane, which is composed of those seven stars, has been and ever will be as it now is, though the moon is sometimes nearer to the sun and sometimes farther from it, and so it is with the rest of the planets. Thus things appear to the old Chaldean shepherds, whose great leisure produced these first observations, which have since been the foundation of astronomy, which science had its birth in Chaldea, as geometry sprung from Egypt where the inundation of the Nile, confounding the bounds of their fields, occasioned their inventing more exact measures to distinguish every one's land from that of his neighbor. So that astronomy was the daughter of idleness, geometry the daughter of interest, and if we did but examine poetry, we should certainly find her the daughter of love. I am glad, says the lady, I have learnt the genealogy of the sciences, and am convinced I must stick to astronomy. My soul is not mercenary enough for geometry, nor is it tender enough for poetry, but I have as much time to spare as astronomy requires. Besides, we are now in the country, and lead a kind of pastoral life, all which suits best with astronomy. Don't deceive yourself, madam, says I. Tis a true shepherd's life to talk of the stars and planets. See if they pass their time so in Aftria. That sort of shepherd's craft, replied she, is too dangerous for me to learn. I love the honest Chaldeans, and you must teach me their rules if you'd have me improve in their science. But let us proceed. When they had ranked the heavens in the manner you tell me, pray, what is the next question? The next, says I, is the disposing the several parts of the universe, which the learned call making a system. But before I expound the first system, I would have you observed we are all naturally like the madman at Athens, who fancied all the ships that came into the Piraean port belonged to him. Nor is our folly less extravagant. We believe all things in nature designed for our use, and do but ask a philosopher to what purpose there is that prodigious company of fixed stars, when a far less number would perform the service they do us. He answers coldly, they were made to please our sight. Upon this principle they imagined the earth rested in the center of the universe, while all the celestial bodies, which were made for it, took the pains to turn round to give light to it. They placed the moon above the earth, Mercury above the moon, after Venus, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Above all these they set the heaven of fixed stars. The earth was just in the middle of those circles which contained the planets, and the greater the circles were, they were the farther distant from the earth, and by consequence the farthest planets took up the most time in finishing their course, which in effect is true. But why, 
says the countess, interrupting me, do you dislike the system? It seems to me very clear and intelligible. However, says I, madam, I will make it plainer, for should I give it you as it came from Ptolemy, its author, or some others who have since studied it, I should fright you, I fancy, instead of diverting you. Since the motions of the planets are not so regular, but that sometimes they go faster, sometimes slower, sometimes are nearer the earth, and sometimes farther from it, the ancients invented I don't know how many orbs or circles, involved one within another, which they thought would solve all objections. This confusion of circles was so great, that at that time when they knew no better, a certain king of Aragon, a great mathematician, but not much troubled with religion, said that had God consulted him when he made the world, he would have told him how to have framed it better. The saying was very atheistical, and no doubt the instructions he would have given the Almighty was the suppressing those circles with which they had clogged the celestial motions, and the taking away two or three superfluous heavens, which they placed above the fixed stars. For these philosophers, to explain the motion of the celestial bodies, had above the uppermost heaven, which we see, found another of crystal, to influence and give motion to the inferior heavens. And wherever they heard of another motion, they presently clapped up a crystal heaven, which cost them nothing. But why, says the countess, must their heaven be of crystal? Would nothing else serve as well? No, no, replied I, nothing so well for the light was to come through them and yet they were to be solid aristotle would have it so he had found solidity to be one of their excellencies and when he had once said it nobody would be so rude as to question it but it seems there were comets much higher than the philosophers expected which as they passed along broke the crystal heavens and confounded the universe but to make the best of a bad market they presently melted down their broken glass and to Aristotle's confusion, made the heavens fluid, and by the observations of these latter ages, it is now out of doubt that Venus and Mercury turn round the sun, and not round the earth, according to the ancient system, which is now everywhere exploded, and all the authorities not worth a rush. But that which I am going to lay down will salve all, and is so clear that the king of Aragon himself may spare his advice. End of chapter 1, part 1chapter one part two of conversations on the plurality of worlds by bernard le Beauvier de fontenelle translated by william gardner this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by michelle kilpatrick methinks says the countess your philosophy is a kind of outcry where he that offers to do the work cheapest carries it from all the rest this says i is very true nature is a great huswife she always makes use of what costs least let the difference be never so inconsiderable and yet this frugality is accompanied with an extraordinary magnificence which shines through all her works that is she is magnificent in the design but frugal in the execution and what can be more praiseworthy than a great design accomplished with a little expense but in our ideas we turn things topsy-turvy we place our thrift in the design and are at ten times more charge in workmanship than it requires which is very ridiculous imitate nature then says she in your system and give me as little trouble as you can to comprehend you madam says i fear it not we've done with our impertinences imagine then a german called copernicus confounding everything tearing in pieces the beloved circles of antiquity and shattering their crystal heavens like so many glass windows seized with the noble rage of astronomy he snatches up the earth from the centre of the universe sends her packing and places the sun in the centre to which it did more justly belong the planets no longer turn round the earth nor enclose it in the circles they describe if they give us light it is but by chance and as they meet us in their way all now goes round the sun even the earth herself and copernicus to punish the earth for her former laziness makes her contribute all he can to the motion of the planets and heavens and now stripped of all the heavenly equipage with which she was so gloriously attended she has nothing left her but the moon 
which still turns round about her. Fair and softly, says the Countess, I fancy you yourself are seized with the noble fury of astronomy. A little less rapture, and I shall understand you better. The sun, you say, is in the center of the universe, and is immovable. Mercury, says I, follows next. He turns round the sun, so that the sun is in the center of the circle, wherein Mercury moves. Above Mercury is Venus, who turns all around the sun. After comes the earth, which being placed higher than Mercury and Venus, makes a greater circle round the sun than either of them. At last comes Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, in the same order I name them, so that Saturn has the greatest circle round the sun, which is the reason he is a longer time in making his revolution than any of the other planets. You have forgot the moon, says the Countess. We shall quickly find her again, says I. The moon turns round the earth and does not leave her, but as the earth advances in the circle, which she describes about the sun, and if the moon turns round the sun, it is because she won't quit the earth. I understand you, says she, and I love the moon for staying with us when all the other planets abandon us. Nay, I fear your German would have willingly taken her away too if he could, for in all his proceedings I find he had a great spite to the earth. "'Twas well done of him, says I, to abate the vanity of mankind, who had taken up the best place in the universe, and it pleases me to see the earth in the crowds of the planets. Sure, says she, you don't think their vanity extends itself so far as astronomy. Do you believe you have humbled me in telling me the earth goes round the sun? For my part, I don't think myself the worse for it. I confess, madam, says I, it is my belief that a fair lady would be much more concerned for her place at a ball than for her rank in the universe, and the precedence of two planets will not make half such a noise in the world as that of two ambassadors. However, the same inclination which reigns at a ceremony governs in a system, and if you love the uppermost place in the one, the philosopher desires the center in the other. He flatters himself that all things were made for him, and insensibly believes a matter of pure speculation to be a point of interest. This is a calumny, says she, you have invented against mankind. Why did they receive this system if it was so erroneous? I know not, says I, but I am sure Copernicus himself distrusted the success of his opinion. T'was a long time before he would venture to publish it, nor had he done it then without the importunity of his friends. But do you know what became of him? The very day they brought him the first printed sheet of his book, he died, foreseeing that he should never be able to clear all the contradictions, and therefore very wisely slipped out of the way. I would be just to all the world, says the Countess, but tis hard to fancy we move, and yet see we do not change our place. We find ourselves in the morning where we lay down at night. Perhaps you'll tell me the whole earth moves. Yes, certainly, says I. "'Tis the same case as if you fell asleep in a boat upon the river. "'When you wake, you find yourself in the same place "'and the same situation in respect to all the parts of the boat. "'Tis true,' replied she, "'but here's a great difference. "'When I wake, I find another shore, "'and that shows me my boat has changed its place. "'But tis not the same with the earth. "'I find all things as I left them. "'No, no,' says I, "'there's another shore, too.' You know that beyond the circles of the planets are fixed stars. There's our shore. I am upon the earth, and the earth makes a great circle round the sun. I look for the center of the circle and see the sun there. Then I direct my sight beyond the sun in a right line, and should certainly discover the fixed stars which answer to the sun, but that the light of the sun effaces them. But at night I easily perceive the stars that corresponded with him in the day, which is exactly the same thing. If the earth did not change its place in the circle where it is, I should see the sun always against the same fixed stars. But when the earth changes its place, the sun must answer to other stars, and there again is your shore, which is always changing. And seeing the earth makes her circle in a year, I see the sun likewise in the space of a year answer successively to the whole circle of the fixed stars, which circle is called the zodiac. I'll draw you the figure of it, if you please, on the sand. "'Tis no matter," says she. "'I can do well enough without it. Besides, it will give an air of learning to my park which I would not have in it. 
for i've heard of a certain philosopher who being shipwrecked and cast upon an unknown island seeing several mathematical figures traced on the seashore cried out to those who followed him courage courage my companions the isle is inhabited behold the footsteps of men but you may spare your figures such footsteps are not decent here i confess madam says i the footsteps of lovers would better become this place that is your name in cipher cut on the trees by your adorers tell me not says she of lovers and adorers i am for my beloved sun and planets but how comes it to pass that the sun as to the fixed stars completes his course but in a year and yet goes over our heads every day did you never replied i observe a bull on the green it runs towards the block and at the same time turns very often round itself so that the parts which were above are below and those which were below are above just so it is with the earth at the same time that she advances on the circle which in a year's space she makes round the sun in twenty-four hours she turns round herself so that in twenty-four hours every part of the earth loses the sun and recovers him again and as it turns towards the sun it seems to rise and as it turns from him it seems to fall tis very pleasant says she that the earth must take all upon herself and the sun do nothing and when the moon the other planets and the fixed stars seem to go over our heads every twenty-four hours you'll say that too is only fancy pure fancy says i which proceeds from the same cause for the planets complete their courses round the sun at unequal times according to their unequal distances and that which to-day we see answer to a certain point in the zodiac or circle of the fixed stars to-morrow will answer to another point because it is advanced on its own circle as well as we are advanced upon ours we move and the planets move too but with more or less rapidity than we this puts us in different points of sight in respect to them and makes us think their course is irregular but there is no occasion of discoursing to you on that head it is sufficient to inform you that what seems irregular in the planets proceeds only from our motion when in truth they are all very regular i will suppose them so says the countess but i would not have their regularity put the earth to so great trouble methinks you exact too much activity from so ponderous a mass but says i had you rather that the sun and all the stars which are vast great bodies should in twenty-four hours make a prodigious tour round the earth and that the fixed stars which are in a circle of infinite extent whose movement is always extreme should run in a day three hundred millions of leagues and go farther than from hence to china in the time that you could say away quick to china as they needs must if the earth did not turn round itself every twenty-four hours to say the truth tis much more reasonable to think that she should make the tour which at most is not above nine thousand leagues you perceive plainly that to set nine thousand leagues against three hundred millions is no trifling difference oh says she the sun and the stars are all fire their motion is not very difficult but the earth i fancy is a little unwieldy that replied i signifies nothing for what think you of a first-rate ship which carries a hundred fifty guns and above three thousand men besides her provisions and other furniture one puff of wind you see sets it a-sailing because the water is liquid and being easily separated very little resists the motion of the ship or if she lie in the middle of a river she will without difficulty drive with the stream because there is nothing to oppose her course so the earth though never so weighty is as easily borne up by the celestial matter which is a thousand times more fluid than the water and fills all that great space where the planets float for how else would you have the earth fastened to resist the motion of the celestial matter and not be driven by it you may as well fancy a little block of wood can withstand the current of a river but pray says she how can the earth with all its weight be borne up by your celestial matter which must be very light because it is so fluid it does not argue says i that what is most fluid is most light for what think you of the great vessel i mentioned just now which with all its burden is yet lighter than the water it floats on i'll have nothing to do with that great vessel says she with some warmth and i begin to apprehend myself in some danger upon such a whirligig as you have made of the earth 
there is no danger replied i but madam if your fears increase we'll have the earth supported by four elephants as the indians believe it heyday cries she here's another system however i love those people for taking care of themselves they have a good foundation to trust to while we copernicans are a little too venturous with the celestial matter and yet i fancy if the indians thought the earth in the least danger of sinking they would double their number of elephants they do well says i laughing at her fancy who would sleep in fear and if you have occasion for him to-night we will put as many as you please in our system we can take them away again by degrees as you grow better confirmed i don't think them very necessary says she i have courage enough to turn you shall turn with pleasure madam says i and shall find delightful ideas in the system for example sometimes i fancy myself suspended in the air without any motion while the earth turns round me in twenty-four hours i see i know not how many different faces pass under me some white some black and some tawny sometimes i see hats and sometimes turbans now heads with hair and then shaved pates here i see cities with steeples some with spires and crescents others with towers of porcelain and anon great countries with nothing but huts here i see vast oceans and there most horrible deserts in short i discover the infinite variety which is upon the surface of the earth i confess says she twenty-four hours would thus be very well bestowed so that in the place where we are now i don't mean in the park but we will suppose ourselves in the air other people continually pass by who take up our place and at the end of twenty-four hours we return to it again copernicus himself says i could not have comprehended it better first then might we see the english passing by us up to the ears in politics yet settling the nation no better than we do the world in the moon then follows a great sea and there perhaps some vessel not near in that tranquillity as we are then comes some of the iroquois going to eat a prisoner for their breakfast who seems as little concerned as his devourers after appear the women of the land of Fefo, who spend all their time in dressing their husbands' dinners and suppers, and painting their lips and eyebrows blue, only to please the greatest brutes in the world. Then the Tartars going devoutly on pilgrimage to their great Prester John, who never comes out of a gloomy apartment all hung with lamps, by the light of which they pay their adoration to him. Then the fair Circassians, who make no scruples of granting everything to the first comer, except what they think essentially belongs to their husbands then the inhabitants of little tartary going to steal concubines from the turks and persians and at last our own dear countrymen it may be in some points as ridiculous as the best of them this says the countess is very pleasant but to imagine what you tell me though i were above and saw all this i would have the liberty to hasten or retard the motion of the earth according as the objects please me more or less and i assure you i should quickly send packing the politicians and man-eaters but should have a great curiosity for the fair circassians for methinks they have a custom very particular but i have a difficulty to clear and you must be serious as the earth moves the air changes every moment so we breathe the air of another country not at all replied i for the air which encompasses the earth does not extend above a certain height perhaps twenty leagues it follows us and turns with us have you not seen the work of the silkworm, the shells which those little animals imprison themselves in, and weave with so much art? They are made of a silk very close, but are covered with a down very loose and soft. So the earth, which is solid, is covered from the surface twenty league upwards with a kind of down, which is the air, and all the shell of the silkworms turns at the same time. Beyond the air is the celestial matter, incomparably more pure and subtle and much more agitated than the air your comparison says she is somewhat mean and yet what wonders are wrought what wars what changes in this little shell tis true replied i but nature takes no notice of such little particular motions but drives us along with the general motion as if she were at bowls methinks says she tis very ridiculous to be upon a thing that turns and be in all this perplexity and yet not be well assured that it does turn and to tell you the truth i begin to distrust the reasons you give why we should not be sensible of the motion of the earth 
for is it possible there should not be some little mark left by which we might perceive it all motions says i the more common and natural they are are the less perceptible and this holds true even in morality the motion of self-love is so natural to us that for the most part we are not sensible of it and we believe we act by other principles now says she are you moralizing to a question of natural philosophy which is running wide of the argument but enough this lecture is sufficient for the first time let us now go home and meet here again to-morrow you with your systems and i with my ignorance in returning back to the castle that i might say all i could on the subject i told her of a third system invented by tycho brahe who had fixed the earth in the centre of the world turned the sun round the earth and the rest of the planets round the sun for since the new discoveries there was no way left to have the planets turn round the earth but the countess with the quickest apprehension replied she thought this too affected a system that among so many great bodies the earth only should be exempted from turning round the sun that it was improper to make the sun turn round the earth when all the planets turn round the sun and that though this scheme was to prove the immobility of the earth yet she thought it very improbable so we resolved to stick to copernicus whose opinion we thought most uniform probable and diverting in a word the simplicity of which convinces and the boldness surprises with pleasure End of chapter 1, part 2chapter two part one of conversations on the plurality of worlds by bernard le Bouvier de fontenelle translated by william gardner this librivox recording is in the public domain the second evening's conversation that the moon is an inhabited world the next morning as soon as any one could get admittance i sent to the countess's apartment to know how she had rested and whether the motion of the earth had not disturbed her she returned for answer she began to be accustomed to it and that copernicus himself had not slept better some time after there came some neighbors to dinner who stayed with her till the evening according to the tiresome custom in the country nay and they were very obliging in going then for the country likewise gives a privilege of extending their visit to the next morning if they are so disposed and have not the conscience to break up so the countess and i found ourselves at liberty in the evening we went again to the park and immediately fell upon our systems she so well retained what i told her the night before that she desired i would proceed without any repetition well madam says i since the sun which is now immovable has left off being a planet and the earth which turns round him is now become one you'll not be surprised when you hear that the moon is an earth too and an habitable world i confess says she i have often heard talk of the world in the moon but i always looked upon it as visionary and mere fancy and says i it may be so still I am in this case as people in a civil war where the uncertainty of what may happen makes them hold intelligence with the opposite party and correspond with their very enemies for though i verily believe the moon is inhabited i live civilly with those who do not believe it and i am like some honest gentleman in point of religion still ready to embrace the prevailing opinion but till the unbelievers have a more considerable advantage i declare for the inhabitants of the moon suppose there had never been any communication between paris and st denis and a cockney who was never beyond the walls of his own city saw st denis from the towers of notre dame you ask him if he believes st denis is inhabited as paris is he presently answers boldly no for says he i see very well the people at paris but those at st denis i don't see at all nor did i ever hear of any there tis true you tell him that from the towers of notre dame he cannot perceive any inhabitants of st denis because of the distance but all that he does discover of st denis very much resembles what he sees at paris the steeples houses walls so that it may very well be inhabited as paris is all this signifies nothing my cockney still maintains that st denis is not inhabited because he sees nobody there 
the moon is our saint denis and every one of us is like this parisian cockney who never went out of his own city you are too severe says she upon your fellow citizens we are not all sure so silly as your cockney since st denis is just like paris he is a fool if he does not think it inhabited but the moon is not at all like the earth take care what you say madam replied i for if the moon resembles the earth you are under a necessity to believe it inhabited if it be so says she i own i cannot be dispensed from believing it and you seem so confident of it that i fear i must whether i will or no tis true the two motions of the earth which i could never imagine till now do a little stagger me as to all the rest but yet how is it possible the earth should enlighten as the moon does without which they cannot be alike if that be all says i the difference is not great for tis the sun which is the sole fountain of light that quality proceeds only from him and if the planets give light to us it is because they first receive it from the sun the sun sends light to the moon and she reflects it back on the earth the earth in the same manner receives light from the sun and sends it to the moon for the distance is the same between the earth and the moon as between the moon and the earth but says the countess is the earth as fit to send back the light of the sun as the moon is you are altogether for the moon says i she is much obliged to you but you must know that light is made up of certain little balls which rebound from what is solid but pass through what admits of en entrance in a right line as air or glass so that what makes the moon enlighten us is that she is a firm and solid body from which the little balls rebound and we must deny our senses if we will not allow the earth the same solidity in short the difference is how we are seated for the moon being at so vast a distance from us we can only discover her to be a body of light and don't perceive that she is a great mass altogether like the earth whereas on the contrary because we are so near the earth we know her to be a great mass proper for the furnishing provision for animals but don't discover her to be a body of light for want of the due distance it is just so with us all says the countess we are dazzled with the quality and fortune of those who are above us when do but examine things nicely and we are all upon a level it's very true says i we would judge of all things but still stand in the wrong places we are too near to judge of ourselves and too far off to know others so that the true way to see things as they are is to be between the moon and the earth to be purely a spectator of this world and not an inhabitant i shall never be satisfied says she for the injustice we do the earth and the too favorable opinion we have of the moon till you assure me that the inhabitants of the moon are as little acquainted with their advantages as we are with ours and that they take our earth for a planet without knowing theirs is one too don't doubt it says i we appear to them to perform very regularly our function of a planet tis true they don't see us make a circle round them but that is no great matter that half of the moon which was turned towards us at the beginning of the world has been turned towards us ever since the eyes mouth and face which we have fancied of the spots in her are still the same and if the other opposite half should appear to us we should no doubt fancy another figure from the different spots that are in it not but that the moon turns upon herself and in the same time that she turns round the earth that is in a month but while she is making that turn upon herself and that she should hide a cheek for example and appear somewhat else to us she makes a like part of her circle round the earth and still presents to us the same cheek so that the moon who in respect of the sun and stars turns round herself in respect of us does not turn at all they seem to her to rise and set in the space of fifteen days but for our earth it appears to her to be held up in the same place of the heavens tis true this apparent immobility is not very agreeable to a body which should pass for a planet but it is not altogether perfect the moon has a kind of trembling which causes a little corner of her face to be sometimes hid from us and a little corner of the opposite half appears 
but then upon my word she attributes that trembling to us and fancies that we have in the heavens the motion of a pendulum which vibrates to and fro i find says the countess the planets are just like us we cast that upon others which is in ourselves says the earth tis not i that turn tis the sun the moon says tis not i that shake tis the earth there is a great deal of error everywhere but i would not advise you says i to undertake the reforming it you had better convince yourself of the entire resemblance of the earth and the moon imagine then these two great bowls held up in the heavens you know that the sun always enlightens the one half of a body that is round and the other half is in the shadow there is then one half of the earth and one half of the moon which is enlightened by the sun that is one half which is day and the other half which is night observe also that as a ball has less force after it has been struck against a wall and rebounds to the other side so is light weakened when it is reflected the pale light which comes to us from the moon is the very light of the sun but it cannot come to us from the moon but by reflection it has lost much of the force and luster it had when it came directly from the sun upon the moon and that bright light which shines directly upon us from the sun and which the earth reflects upon the moon is as pale and weak when it arrives there so that the light which appears to us in the moon and enlightens our nights is the part of the moon which has day and that part of the earth which has day when it is opposite to the part of the moon which has night gives light to it all depends upon how the moon and the earth behold one another at the beginning of the month we don't see the moon because she is between the sun and us that half of her which has day is then turned towards the sun and that half which has night turned towards us we can't see it then because it has no light upon it but that half of the moon which has night being turned to the half of the earth which has day sees us without being perceived and we then appear to them just as the full moon does to us so that as i may say the inhabitants of the moon have then a full earth but the moon being advanced upon her circle of a month comes from under the sun and begins to turn towards us a little corner of the half which is light there's the crescent then those parts of the moon which have night don't see all the half of the earth which has day and we are then in the wane to them i understand you perfectly says the countess without hesitation i can comprehend the rest at pleasure and i have nothing to do but think a moment and bring the moon upon her circle of a month i see in general that the inhabitants of the moon have a month quite contrary to us when we have a full moon their half of the moon which is light is turned to our half of the earth which is dark they don't see us at all and they have then a new earth this is plain i would not stand the reproach of requiring a long explication on so easy a point but now tell me how come the eclipses you may easily guess that says i when it is new moon that she is between the sun and us and all her dark half is turned towards us who have light that obscure shadow is cast upon us if the moon be directly under the sun that shadow hides him from us and at the same time obscures a part of that half of the earth which is light which was seen by that half of the moon which was dark here then is an eclipse of the sun to us during our day and an eclipse of the earth to the moon during her night when it is full moon the earth is between her and the sun and all the dark half of the earth is turned towards all the light half of the moon the shadow then of the earth casts itself towards the moon and if it falls on the moon it obscures that light half which we see which then has day and hinders the sun from shining on it here then is an eclipse of the moon to us during our night and an eclipse of the sun to the moon during her day but the reason that we have not eclipses every time that the moon is between the sun and the earth or the earth between the sun and the moon is because these three bodies are not exactly placed in a right line and by consequence that which should make the eclipse casts its shadow a little beside that which should be obscured i am surprised says the countess that there should be so little mystery in eclipses and that the whole world should not know the cause of them 
nor ever will says i as some people go about it in the east indies when the sun and the moon are in eclipse they believe a certain devil who has black claws is seizing on those planets with his talons and during that time the rivers are covered with the heads of indians who are up to the neck in water because they esteem it a very devout posture to implore the sun and the moon to defend them against the devil in america they are persuaded that the sun and the moon when eclipsed are angry and what is it they will not do to be reconciled with them the greeks who were so refined also believed the moon was then enchanted and that the magicians forced her to descend from heaven and shed a malignant juice on the plants nay what a panic fear were we in not above forty years ago at an eclipse of the sun how many people hid themselves in cellars and all the philosophers who treated of its cause could not persuade them to come out till the eclipse was over in good faith says she tis scandalous for men to be such cowards there ought to be a general law of mankind to prohibit the discoursing of eclipses that we might not call to mind the follies that have been said and done upon that subject your law then says i must abolish even the memory of all things and forbid us to speak at all for i know nothing in the world which is not a monument of the folly of man end of chapter two part one chapter two part two of conversations on the plurality of worlds by bernard le Bouvier de fontenelle translated by william gardner this librivox recording is in the public domain but what do you think says she of the inhabitants of the moon are they as fearful of an eclipse as we are it would be a very good jest to see the indians there up to the neck in water that the americans should believe the earth angry with them the greeks fancy we were bewitched and would destroy their plants in short that we should cause the same consternation among them as they among us and why not says i i don't at all doubt it for why should the people in the moon have more wit than we what right have they to affright us and not we them for my part continued i laughing i believe that since a prodigious company of men have been and still are such fools to adore the moon there certainly are people in the moon that worship the earth and that we are upon our knees the one to the other but sure says she we don't pretend to send any influences to the moon and to give a crisis to her sick if the people have any wit in those parts they'll soon destroy the honor we flatter ourselves with and i fear we shall have the disadvantage madam says i don't fear that do you think we are the only fools of the universe is it not consistent with ignorance to spread itself everywhere tis true we can only guess at the folly of the people in the moon but i no more doubt it than i do the most authentic news that comes from thence what authentic news comes from thence says she that which the learned bring us replied i who travel thither every day with their tubes and telescopes they'll tell you of their discoveries of lands seas lakes high mountains and deep abysses indeed says she i fancy they may discover mountains and abysses because of the remarkable inequality but how do they distinguish lands and seas very easily says i for the waters letting part of the light pass through them send back but a very little so that they appear afar off like so many dark spots whereas the lands being solid reflect the whole light and appear to be more bright and shining the famous monsieur cassini a man of the largest acquaintance in the world with the firmament discovered in the moon something which divided then reunited and sunk in a sort of wells we may with very much probability suppose this was a river nay they pretend to be so well acquainted with the several places that they have given them all names one they call copernicus another archimedes and a third galileus there is the caspian sea the black lake the porphyrite mountains in short they have published such exact descriptions of the moon that a very almanac maker will be no more to seek there than i am in paris i must own then says the countess they are very exact but what do they say to the inside of the country i would very fain know that tis impossible replied i the most learned astronomers of our age cannot inform you 
you must ask that of aloiso who was carried into the moon by st john i'm going to tell you one of the agreeable follies of ariosto which i'm confident you'll be well pleased to hear i must confess he had better have let alone st john whose name is worthy of respect but tis a poetical license and must be allowed the poem which is called orlando furioso is dedicated to a cardinal and a great pope has honoured it with his approbation which is prefixed to several of the editions this is the argument roland nephew to charlemagne falls mad because the fair angelica prefers medor before him astolfo a knight-errant finding himself one day in the terrestrial paradise which was upon the top of a very high mountain where he was carried by his flying horse meets st john there who tells him if he would have roland cured he must make a voyage with him into the moon astolfo who had a great mind to see new countries did not stand much upon entreaty there immediately came a fiery chariot which carried the apostle and the knight up into the air astolfo being no great philosopher was surprised to find the moon so much bigger than it appeared to him when he was upon the earth to see rivers seas mountains cities forests nay what would have surprised me too nymphs hunting in those forests but that which appeared most remarkable was a valley where you might find anything that was lost in our world of what nature soever crowns riches fame and an infinity of hopes the time we spend in play and in searching for the philosopher's stone the alms we give after our death the verses we present to great men and princes and the sighs of lovers i don't know says the countess what became of the sighs of lovers in ariosto's time but i fancy there are very few of them ascend to the moon in our days ah madam replied i how many does your ladyship send thither every day those that are addressed to you will make a considerable heap and i assure you the moon keeps all safe that is lost here below yet i must tell you ariosto does but whisper it though everything is there even the donation of constantine the popes have pretended to be masters of rome and italy by virtue of a donation which the emperor constantine made sylvester and the truth on it is nobody knows what's become of it but what do you think is not to be found in the moon folly all that ever was upon the earth is kept there still but in lieu of it tis not to be imagined how many wits if i may so call em that are lost here are got up into the moon they are so many vials full of a very subtle liquor which evaporates immediately if it be not well stopped and upon every one of these vials the names are written to whom the wits belong i think ariosto has heaped them upon one another a little confusedly but for order's sake we will fancy him placed upon shelves in a long gallery astolfo wondered to see several vials full inscribed with the names of persons whom he thought considerable for their wisdom to confess the truth i begin to fear since i have entertained you with these philosophical and poetical visions mine there is not very empty however tis some consolation to me that while you were so attentive you have a little glass full as well as your humble servant the good knight found his own wits among the rest and with the apostle's leave snuffed it all up his nose like so much hungry water but ariosto said he did not carry it far it returned again to the moon a little after well he did not forget roland's vial which was the occasion of his voyage but he was cursedly plagued to carry it for heroes wits are naturally very heavy and there did not want one drop of it to conclude ariosto according to his laudable custom of saying whatever he pleases addresses himself to his mistress in very beautiful verses fair mistress who for me to heaven shall fly to bring again from thence my wandering wit which i still lose since from that piercing eye the dark came forth that first my heart did hit nor of my loss at all complain would i might i but keep that which remaineth yet but if it still decrease within short space i doubt i shall be in rolando's case yet well i wot where to recover mind though not in paradise nor cynthia's sphere 
yet doubtless in a place no less divine in that sweet face of yours in that fair hair that ruby lip in those two star-like eyne there is my wit i know it wanders there and with my lips if you would give me leave i there would search i thence would it receive is not this very pleasant to reason like ariosto the safest way of losing our wits is to be in love for you see they don't go far from us we may recover em again at our lips but when we lose em by other means as for example by philosophizing they are gone with a jerk into the moon and there is no coming at em again when we would however says the countess our vials have an honourable station among the philosophers when tis forty to one but love fixes our wits on an object we cannot but be ashamed of but to take away mine entirely pray tell me very seriously if you believe there are any men in the moon for methinks hitherto you have not been very positive for my part says i i don't believe there are men in the moon for do but observe how much the face of nature is changed between this and china other visages shapes manners nay almost other principles of reason and therefore between us and the moon the alteration must be much more considerable in the lands that have been lately discovered we can scarce call the inhabitants men they are rather animals in human shape and that too sometimes very imperfect almost without human reason he therefore that will travel to the moon must not expect to find men there what sort of people are they then says the countess with an air of impatience troth madam replied i i don't know for put the case that we ourselves inhabited the moon and were not men but rational creatures could we imagine do you think such fantastical people upon the earth as mankind is is it possible we should have an idea of so strange a composition a creature of such foolish passions and such wise reflections granted but such a span of life and yet pursuing views of such extent so learned in trifles and so stupidly ignorant in matters of the greatest importance so much concern for liberty and yet such great inclinations to servitude so desirous of happiness and yet so very incapable of being so the people in the moon must be wise indeed to suppose all this of us but don't we see ourselves continually and can't so much as guess how we were made so that we are forced to say the gods when they created us were drunk with nectar and when they were sober again could not choose but laugh at their own handiwork well well says the countess we are safe enough then they in the moon know nothing of us but i could wish we were a little better acquainted with them for it troubles me that we should see the moon above us and yet not know what is done there why says i are you not as much concerned for that part of the earth which is not yet discovered what creatures inhabit it and what they do there for we and they are carried in the same vessel they possess the prow and we the poop and yet there is no manner of communication between us they don't know at one end of the ship who lives or what is done at the other end and you would know what passes in the moon which is another great vessel sailing in the heavens at a vast distance from us oh says she for the earth i reckon it all as good as discovered and can guess at the people though i never heard a word of em for tis certain they all very much resemble us and we may know em better when we have a mind to it they'll stay where they are and tis no more but going to see em but we can't get into the moon if we would so that i despair of knowing what they do there you'll laugh at me says i if i should answer you seriously perhaps i may deserve it and yet i fancy i can say a great deal to justify a ridiculous thought that has just now come into my head nay to use the fool's best argument i'll lay a wager i make you own in spite of reason that one of these days there may be a communication between the earth and the moon and who knows what great advantages we may reap by it do but consider america before it was discovered by columbus 
how profoundly ignorant were those people they knew nothing at all of arts and sciences they went naked had no other arms but bows and arrows and did not apprehend they might be carried by animals they looked upon the sea as a wide space not for the use of men that it was joined to the heavens and beyond it was nothing tis true after having spent whole years in hollowing the trunks of great trees with sharp stones they put themselves to sea in these trunks and floated from land to land as the wind and waves drove them but how often was their trough overset and they forced to recover it again by swimming so that except when they were on land it might be said they were continually swimming and yet had any one but told them of another kind of navigation incomparably more perfect and useful than their own that would easily convey over that infinite space of water that they might stop in the middle of the waves and in some sense command the winds and make their vessel go fast or slow as they pleased in short that this impassable ocean should be no obstacle to their conversing with another different people do you think they'd have believed you and yet at last that day has come the unheard of and most surprising sight appears vast great bodies with white wings are seen to fly upon the sea to vomit fire from all parts and to cast on their shores an unknown people all sealed with iron who dispose and govern monsters as they please carry thunder in their hands and overthrow and destroy whoever resists them from whence came they who brought them over the sea who gave to him the disposal of the fire of heaven are they gods are they the offspring of the sun for certainly they are not men do but consider madam the surprise of the americans there can be nothing greater and after this will any one say there shall never be a communication between the moon and the earth did the americans believe there would ever be any between them and europe till it came to pass tis true you must pass this great space of air and heaven which is between the earth and the moon but did not those vast seas seem at first as impassable to the americans you rave i think says she who denies it madam said i nay but i'll prove it replies she i don't care for your bare owning it did you not own the americans were so ignorant that they had not the least conception of crossing the sea but we who know a great deal more than they can imagine and fancy the going through the air though we are assured it is not to be done there is somewhat more than fancy replied i when it has been already practiced for several have found the secret of fastening wings which bear them up in the air to move them as they please and to fly over rivers and from steeple to steeple i can't say indeed that they have yet made an eagle's flight or that it does not cost now and then a leg or an arm to one of these new birds but this may serve to represent the first planks that were launched on the water and which were the beginning of navigation there were no vessels then thought of to sail around the world and yet you see what great ships are grown by little and little from those rude planks the art of flying is but newly invented twill improve by degrees and in time grow perfect then we may fly as far as the moon we don't yet pretend to have discovered all things or that what we have discovered can receive no addition and therefore pray let us agree there are yet many things to be done in the ages to come were you to live a thousand years says the countess i can never believe you'll fly but you must endanger your neck i will not replied i be so unmannerly as to contradict a fair lady but though we can't learn the art here i hope you will allow they may fly better in the moon tis no great matter whether we go to them or they come to us we shall then be like the americans who knew nothing of navigation and yet there were very good ships at t'other end of the world were it so says she in a sort of passion the inhabitants of the moon would have been here before now all in good time says i the europeans were not in america till about some six thousand years they were so long in improving navigation to the point of crossing the ocean 
the people on the moon have already made some short voyages in the air they are exercising continually and by degrees will be more expert then we shall see him and god knows how we shall be surprised it is unsufferable says she you should banter me at this rate and justify your ridiculous fancy by such false reasoning i'm going to demonstrate says i you reproach me very unjustly consider madam that the world is unfolded by degrees for the ancients were very positive that the torrid and frigid zones were not habitable by reason of their excessive heat and cold and in the time of the romans the general map of the world was but very little extended beyond that of their empire which though in one respect expressed much grandeur in another sense was a sign of as great ignorance however there were men found both in very hot and in very cold countries so that you see the world is already increased after that it was thought that the ocean covered the whole earth except what was then discovered there was no talk then of the antipodes not so much as a thought of them for who could fancy their heels at top and their heads at bottom and yet after all their fine reasoning the antipodes were discovered here's now another half of the world starts up and a new reformation of the map methinks this madam should restrain us and teach us not to be so positive in our opinions the world will unfold itself more to us hereafter we shall then know the people in the moon as well as we do now the antipodes but all things must be done in order the whole earth must be discovered until we are perfectly acquainted with our own habitation we shall never know that of our neighbors without fooling says the countess looking earnestly upon me you are so very profound in this point that i begin to think you are in earnest and believe what you say not so neither says i but i would show you how easy it is to maintain a chimerical notion that may perplex a man of understanding but never convince him there is no persuasive like truth it has no need to exert all its proofs but enters naturally into our understanding and when once we have learned it we do nothing but think of it i thank you then says she for imposing on me no longer for i confess your false reasoning disturbed me but now i shall sleep very quietly if you think fit to go home end of chapter two part two Chapter 3, Part 1 of Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds by Bernard Le Bovier de Fontenelle, translated by William Gardner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Third Evening's Conversation Some Particulars Concerning the World in the Moon and Proofs of the Other Planets Being Likewise Inhabited the countess was so intent upon her notions that she would fain have engaged me next day to go on where i left off but i told her since the moon and stars were become the subject of our discourse we should trust our chimeras with nobody else at night we went again into the park which was now dedicated to our learned conversation well madam says i i have great news for you that which i told you last night of the moon's being inhabited may not be so now there is a new fancy got into my head which puts those people in great danger i can't suffer that says she yesterday you were preparing me to receive a visit from them and now there are no such folks in nature you must not trifle with me thus once you would have me believe the moon was inhabited i surmounted the difficulty i had and will now believe it you are a little too nimble replied i didn't i advise you never to be entirely convinced in things of this nature but to reserve half your understanding free and disengaged that you might admit of a contrary opinion if there should be any occasion i care not for your sentences says she let us come to matter of fact are we not to consider the moon as st denis no says i the moon does not so much resemble the earth as st denis does paris the sun draws vapors from the earth and exhalations from the water which mounting to a certain height in the air do there assemble and form the clouds these uncertain clouds are driven irregularly round the globe 
sometimes shadowing one country and sometimes another he then who beholds the earth from afar off will see frequent alterations upon its surface because a great country overcast with clouds will appear dark or light as the clouds stay or pass over it he'll see the spots on the earth often change their place and appear or disappear as the clouds remove but we see none of these changes wrought upon the moon which would certainly be the same were there but clouds about her but on the contrary all her spots are fixed and certain and her light parts continue where they were at first which indeed is a great misfortune for by this reason the sun draws no exhalations or vapours above the moon so that it appears she is a body infinitely more hard and solid than the earth whose subtle parts are easily separated from the rest and mount upwards as soon as heat puts them in motion but it must be a heap of rock and marble where there is no evaporation besides exhalations are so natural and necessary where there is water that there can be no water at all where there is no exhalation and what sort of inhabitants must those be whose country affords no water is all rock and produces nothing very fine says she you have forgot since you assured me we might from hence distinguish seas in the moon pray what has become of your caspian sea and your black lake all conjecture madam replied i though for your ladyship's sake i am very sorry for it for those dark places we took to be seas may perhaps be nothing but large cavities tis hard to guess right at so great a distance but will this suffice then says she to extirpate the people in the moon not altogether replied i we will neither determine for nor against them i must own my weakness if it be one says she i can't be so perfectly undetermined as you would have me to be but must believe one way or other therefore pray fix me quickly in my opinion as to the inhabitants of the moon preserve or annihilate them as you please and yet methinks i have a strange inclination for em and would not have em destroyed if it were possible to save em you know says i madam i can deny you nothing the moon shall be no longer a desert but to do you service we will repeople her since to all appearance the spots on the moon do not change i can't conceive there are any clouds about her that sometimes obscure one part and sometimes another yet this does not hinder but that the moon sends forth exhalations and vapours our clouds which we see in the air are nothing but exhalations and vapours which at their coming out of the earth were separated into such minute particles that they could not be discerned but as they ascend higher they are condensed by the cold and by the reunion of their parts are rendered visible after which they become great clouds which fluctuate in the air their improper region till they return back again in rain however these exhalations and vapours sometimes keep themselves so dispersed that they are imperceptible or if they do assemble it is in forming such subtle dews that they cannot be discerned to fall from any cloud now for that it is incredible that the moon is such a mass that all its parts are of an equal solidity all at rest one with another and all incapable of any alterations from the efficacy of the sun i am sure we are yet unacquainted with such a body marble itself is of another nature and even that which is most solid is subject to change and alteration either from the secret and invisible motion it has within itself or from that which it receives from without it may so happen that the vapours which issue from the moon may not assemble round her in clouds and may not fall back again in rain but only in dews it is sufficient for this that the air with which the moon is environed for it is certain that the moon is encompassed with air as well as the earth be a little different from our air and the vapours of the moon a little different from those of the earth which is very probable hereupon the matter being otherwise disposed in the moon than on the earth the effects must be different though it is of no great consequence whether they are or no for from the moment we have found an inward motion in the parts of the moon or one produced by foreign causes here is enough for the new birth of its inhabitants and a sufficient and necessary fund for their subsistence this will furnish us with corn fruit water and what we please else i mean according to the custom or manner of the moon which i do not pretend to know and all proportion to the wants and uses of the inhabitants with whom i pretend to be as little acquainted that is to say 
replied the countess you know all is very well without knowing how it is so which is a great deal of ignorance upon a very little knowledge however i comfort myself that you have given the moon her inhabitants again and have wrapped her in an air of her own without which a planet would seem to me but very naked tis these two different airs says i that hinder the communication of the two planets if it was only flying as i told you yesterday who knows but we might improve it to perfection though i confess there is but little hopes of it the great distance between the moon and the earth is a difficulty not easily to be surmounted yet were the distance but inconsiderable and the two planets almost contiguous it would be still impossible to pass from the air of the one into the air of the other the water is the air of fishes they never pass into the air of the birds nor the birds into the air of the fish and yet tis not the distance that hinders them but both are imprisoned by the air they breathe in we find our air consists of thicker and grosser vapours than the air of the moon so that one of her inhabitants arriving at the confines of our world as soon as he enters our air will inevitably drown himself and we shall see him fall dead on the earth i should rejoice at a wreck says the countess of a good number of these lunar people how pleasant would it be to see them lie scattered on the ground where we might consider at our ease their extraordinary figures but what says i if they could swim on the outward surface of our air and be as curious to see us as you are to see them should they angle or cast a net for us as for so many fish would that please you why not says the countess smiling for my part i would go into their nets of my own accord were it but for the pleasure to see such strange fishermen consider says i you would be very sick when you were drawn to the top of our air for it is not respirable in all its extent as may be seen on the tops of some very high mountains and i admire that they who have the folly to believe that our fairies whom they allow to be corporeal and to inhabit the most pure and refined air don't tell us that the reason why they give us such short and seldom visits is that there are very few among them that can dive and those that can if it be possible to get through the thick air where we are cannot stay half so long in it as your diving fowls can in the water here then are natural barricades which defend the passage out of our world as well as the entry into that of the moon so that since we can only guess at that world let us fancy all we can of it for example i will suppose that we may see there the firmament the sun and the stars of another color than what they are here all these appear to us through a kind of natural spectacles which change and alter the objects these spectacles are our air mixed as it is with vapors and exhalations and which does not extend itself very high some of our modern philosophers pretend of itself it is blue as well as the water of the sea and that this color neither appears in the one nor in the other but at a great depth the firmament say they where the fixed stars are fastened has no peculiar light of its own and by consequence must appear black but we see it through the air which is blue and therefore to us it appears blue which if so the beams of the sun and stars cannot pass through the air without being tinged a little with its color and losing as much of their own yet were the air of no color it is very certain that through a great mist the light of a flambeau at some distance appears reddish though it be not its true natural color our air is nothing but a great mist which changes the true color of the sky of the sun and of the stars it belongs only to the celestial matter to bring us the light and colors as they really are in all their purity so that since the air of the moon is of another nature than our air or is stained of another color or at least is another kind of mist which causes other alterations to the colors of the celestial bodies in short as to the people of the moon their spectacles through which they see everything are changed if it be so says the countess i prefer my abode before that of the moon for i can't believe the celestial colors are so well suited as they are here for instance let us put green stars on a red sky they can't be so agreeable as stars of gold on an azure firmament to hear you says i one would think you was choosing a petticoat or a suit of knots but believe me nature does not want fancy leave it to her to choose colors for the moon and i'll engage they shall be well sorted 
she will not fail to vary the prospect of the universe at every different point of sight, and the alteration shall always be very agreeable. I know very well, says the Countess, her skill in this point. She is not at the charge of changing the objects, but only the spectacles, and has the credit of this great variety, without being at any expense. With a blue air she gives us a blue firmament, and perhaps with a red air she gives to the inhabitants of the moon a red firmament, and yet still it is but the same firmament. Nay, I am of opinion she has placed a sort of spectacles in our imagination, through which we see all things, and which to every particular man change the objects. Alexander looked on the earth as a fit place to establish a great empire. It seemed to Celadon a proper residence for Astria, and it appeared to a philosopher a great planet in the heavens covered with fools. I don't believe the sights vary more between the earth and the moon than they do between one man's fancy and another's. This change in our imaginations, says I, is very surprising, for they are still the same objects, though they appear different when in the moon we may see other objects we do not see here, or at least not see all there, we do see here. Perhaps in that country they know nothing of the dawn and the twilight before the sun rises, and after the sun sets. The air which encompasses and is elevated above us receives the rays so that they can't strike on the earth, and being gross stops some of them and sends them to us, though indeed they were never naturally designed us so that the daybreak and the twilight are a favor which nature bestows on us. They are a light which regularly we should not have, and which she gives us over and above our due. But in the moon, where apparently the air is more pure, and therefore not so proper to send down the beams it receives from the sun before his rising, and after his setting, they have not that light of grace, as I may call it, which growing greater by degrees does more agreeably prepare him for the arrival of the sun, and which growing weaker and diminishing by degrees does insensibly prepare him for the sun's departure. But they are in a profound darkness where a curtain, as it were, is drawn all on a sudden. Their eyes are immediately dazzled with the whole light of the sun, in all its glory and brightness. So likewise they are on a sudden surprised with utter darkness. The night and the day have no medium between them, but they fall in a moment from one extreme into the other, the rainbow, likewise, is not known to them in the moon, for if the dawn is an effect of the grossness of the air and vapors, the rainbow is formed in the clouds from whence the rain falls, so that the most beautiful things in the world are produced by those things which have no beauty at all. Since then there are no vapors thick enough, nor are no clouds of rain about the moon, farewell dawn, adieu rainbow. What must lovers do for similes to liken their mistresses to in that country, when such an inexhaustible magazine of comparisons is taken from them? Nay, I shall never take the loss of their comparisons much to heart, says the Countess. And I think them well enough recompensed for the loss of our dawn and rainbow, for by the same reason they have neither thunder nor lightning, both which are formed in the clouds. How glorious are their days, the sun continually shining! how pleasant their nights when not the least star is hid from them they never hear of storms or tempests which seem plain effects of the wrath of heaven do you think they stand in need of our pity you are describing the moon replied i like an enchanted residence but do you think it is so pleasant to have a scorching sun always over our head where the days are fifteen times as long as ours and not the least cloud to moderate its heat though I fancy tis for this reason that nature has made great cavities in the moon. We can discern them easily with our telescopes, for they are not mountains, but so many wells or vaults in the middle of a plain. And what do we know but the inhabitants of the moon, being continually broiled by the excessive heat of the sun, do retire into those great wells? Perhaps they live nowhere else, and tis there they build them cities, for we still see in the ruins of old Rome, that that part of the city which was underground was almost as large as that which was above ground. We need but take that part away, and the rest would remain like one of these lunar towns. The whole people reside in wells, and from one well to another there are subterranean passages for the communication of the inhabitants. I perceive you laugh at me, but you are at your liberty, 
yet to deal freely with you you deserve it much better than i for you believe the people in the moon must live upon the surface of their planet because we do so upon ours but quite contrary since we dwell upon the superficies of our planet they should not dwell upon the superficies of their planet if things differ so much in this world what must they do in another end of chapter three part one chapter three part two of conversations on the plurality of worlds by bernard le Beauvier de fontenelle translated by william gardner this librivox recording is in the public domain tis no matter says the countess i can never suffer the inhabitants of the moon to live in perpetual darkness you will be more concerned for him replied i when i tell you that one of the ancient philosophers did long since discover the moon to be the abode of the blessed souls departed out of this life and that all their happiness consisted in hearing the harmony of the spheres which is made by the motion of the celestial bodies but because the philosopher pretends to know exactly all they do there he tells you that when the moon is obscured by the shadow of the earth they no longer hear the heavenly music but howl like so many souls in purgatory so that the moon taking pity on him makes all the haste she can to get into the light again methinks then says she we should now and then see some of the blessed souls arrive here from the moon for certainly they are sent to us and between the two planets some think there is sufficient provision made for the felicity of souls by their transportation into a new world i confess indeed says i it would be very pleasant to see different worlds such a voyage though but in imagination is very delightful but what would it be in effect it would be much better certainly than to go to japan which at best is but crawling from one end of the world to t'other and after all to see nothing but men well then says she let us travel over the planets as fast as we can what should hinder us let us place ourselves at all the different prospects and from thence consider the universe but first have we any more to see in the moon yes replied i that world is not yet entirely exhausted you remember well that the two movements which turn the moon on herself and about us being equal the one always presents to our eyes that part which the other must consequently deprive us of and so she always wears the same face to us we have then but one moiety of her which looks on us and as the moon must be supposed not to turn on her own centre in respect to us that moiety which sees us always and that fixed in the same point of the firmament when it is night with her and her nights are equal to fifteen of our days she at first sees but a little corner of the earth enlightened after that a larger spot and so almost by hourly gradations spread her light till it covers the whole face of the earth whereas these same changes do not appear to us to affect the moon but from one night to another because we lose her a long time out of our sight i would give anything that i could possibly divine the awkward reasonings of the philosophers of their world upon our earth's appearing immovable to them when all the other celestial bodies rise and set over their heads within the compass of fifteen days tis plain they attribute this immobility to her bigness for she is forty times bigger than the moon and when their poets are in the mind to extol unactive and indolent princes i doubt not but they take care to compare their inactivity to this majestic repose of the earth however this opinion is attended with one difficulty they must very sensibly perceive in the moon that our earth turns upon her own centre for instance imagine that our europe asia and america present themselves one after another to them in little and in different shapes and figures almost as we see them upon our maps now this sight must be a novelty to such travellers as pass from that moiety of the moon which never sees us to that which always does good god how cautious would they be of believing the relation of the first travellers who should speak of it after their return to that great country to which we are so utterly unknown now i fancy says the countess that they make a sort of pilgrimage from one side of their country to the other for their disquisitions into our world and that there are certain honors and privileges assigned to such as have once in their lives had a view of our gross planet at least replied i 
those who have had this view have had the privilege of being better lighted during their nights the residence in the other moiety of the moon must of necessity be much less commodious in that respect but madam let us continue the journey we propose to take from one planet to another for we have now taken a pretty curious view of the moon coming out of the moon towards the sun we see venus which puts me again in mind of st denis venus turns upon herself and round the sun as well as the moon they likewise discover by their telescopes that venus like the moon if i may speak after the same manner is sometimes new sometimes full and sometimes in the wane according to the different situation she is in in respect of the earth the moon to all appearance is inhabited why should not venus be so too you are so full of your whys and your wherefores says she interrupting me that i fancy you are sending colonies to all the planets you may be certain so i will replied i for i see no reason to the contrary we find that all the planets are of the same nature all obscure bodies which receive no light but from the sun and then send it to one another their motions are the same so that hitherto they are alike and yet if we are to believe that these vast bodies are not inhabited i think they were made but to little purpose why should nature be so partial as to accept only the earth but let who will say the contrary i must believe the planets are peopled as well as the earth i find says she you have been very well confirmed in your notions this pretty while twas but some moments since that the moon was a desert and you were in no concern at it and at this instant i see you would be in a violent passion if any one should presume to say that all the planets are not as well stocked with inhabitants as the earth tis true says i at the instant you surprised me with your objections if you had disputed with me the inhabitants of the planets i should not only have maintained their existence but perhaps likewise have discoursed to you on their creation we have our times for believing of things and i never believed them more firmly than at that juncture and even now and when my senses are somewhat cooler on the matter i can't help thinking it would be strange that the earth should be so well peopled and the other planets not inhabited at all for do you believe we discover as i may say all the inhabitants of the earth there are as many kinds of invisible as visible creatures we see from the elephant to the very handworm beyond which our sight fails us and yet counting from that minute creature there are an infinity of lesser animals which would be imperceptible without the aid of glasses we see with magnifying glasses that the least drops of rain-water vinegar and all other liquids are full of little fishes or serpents which we could never have suspected there and there is some reason to suspect that the taste which these little liquids gives proceeds from the stingings and pungency of those little animals on the tongue and palate now mingling certain things with any one of these liquors and exposing them in the sun or letting them stand and corrupt will produce a new species of little animals several even of the most solid bodies are nothing but an immense swarm of imperceptible animals who find for their respective motions as much room and liberty as they require do you but consider this little leaf why it is a great world inhabited by little invisible worms of a vast extent what mountains what abysses are there in it the insects of one side know no more of their fellow creatures on t'other side than you and i can tell what they are now doing at the antipodes does it not stand more to reason then that a great planet should be inhabited in the hardest stones for example in marble there are an infinity of worms which fill up the vacuums and feed upon the substance of the stone fancy then millions of living creatures to subsist many years on a grain of sand so that were the moon but one continued rock i would sooner allow her to be gnawed by these invisible mites than not to be inhabited in short everything is animated imagine then those animals which are yet undiscovered and add them and those which are but lately discovered to those we have always seen you will find the earth swarms with inhabitants and that nature has so liberally furnished it with animals that she is not at all concerned for our not seeing above one half of them why then should nature which is fruitful to an excess here be so very barren in the rest of the planets as to produce no living thing in them 
I must own, says the Countess, you have convinced my reason, but you have confounded my fancy with such variety that I can't imagine how nature, which hates repetitions, should produce so many different kinds. There is no need of fancy, replied I. Do but trust your eyes, and you will easily perceive how nature diversifies in these several worlds. All human faces, in general, are of the same model, and yet the Europeans and the Africans have two particular moulds, nay, commonly every family have a different form. What secret, then, has nature to shew so much variety in the single face? Our world, in respect of the universe, is but a little family, all whose faces have some resemblance. In another planet, there is another family, whose faces have a different air and make, the difference, too, increases with the distance, for whoever should see an inhabitant of the moon and an inhabitant of the earth would soon perceive they were nearer neighbors than one of the earth and one of Saturn. Here, for example, we have the use of voice. In another world they speak by signs, and at a greater distance they do not speak at all. Here our reason is formed by experience. In the next world, Experience contributes but little towards it, and in the next to that, old men know no more than children. Here we are troubled more with what is to come than with what is past. In the next world, they are more troubled for what's past than what's to come, and farther off, they are not concerned with either, which, by the way, I think is much the better. Here tis thought we want a sixth sense, which would teach us many things of which we are now ignorant. This sixth sense is apparently in another world, where they want one of the five which we enjoy. Nay, perhaps there is a much greater number of senses, but in the partition we have made of them with the inhabitants of the other planets, there are but five fall into our share, with which we are well contented for want of being acquainted with the rest. Our sciences have bounds which the wit of man could never pass. There is a point where they fail us on a sudden. The rest is reserved for other worlds or somewhat which we know is unknown to them. This planet enjoys the pleasures of love, but lies desolate in several places by the fury of war. In another planet they enjoy perpetual peace, yet in the midst of that peace know nothing of love, and time lies on their hands. In a word, that which nature practices here in little, in distributing her gifts among mankind, she does at large in other worlds, where she makes use of that admirable secret she has to diversify all things, and at the same time makes them equal, by compensating for the inequality. But is it not time, madam, to be serious? How will you dispose of all these notions? Trouble not yourself, says she. Fancy is a great traveler. I already comprehend these several worlds, and form to myself their different characters and customs. Some of them, I assure you, are very extraordinary. I see at this moment a thousand different figures, though I cannot well describe them. Oh, leave them, replied I, to your dreams. We shall know tomorrow whether they represent the matter faithfully, and what they have taught you in relation to the inhabitants of any of the planets. End of chapter 3, part 2 Chapter 4, Part 1 of Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Conversations on the Plurality of Worlds by Bernard Le Beauvier de Fontenelle translated by William Gardner. Chapter 4. The Fourth Evening's Conversation. Some Particulars Concerning the World of Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Her dreams were not very successful. They still represented to her objects such as we are acquainted with here on earth, and I had room to reproach the Countess as those people do us at the sight of our regular pictures, who themselves make only wild and grotesque paintings. Well, say they, this is only an imitation of men. There is no manner of fancy in it. We were therefore forced to conclude ourselves ignorant what sort of inhabitants all these planets had, 
and content ourselves only to guess at them and continue the voyage we had begun through the worlds we were come to venus and i told her that venus certainly turned on itself though nobody could tell in what time and consequently were ignorant how long her day lasted but her year was composed of eight months because tis in that time she turns round the sun and seeing venus is forty times less than the earth the earth appears to them in venus to be a planet forty times bigger than venus appears to us on the earth and as the moon is forty times lesser than the earth so she seems to be just of the same magnitude to the inhabitants of venus as venus seems here to us i see then says the countess that the earth is not to venus what venus is to the earth i mean that the earth is too big to be the mother of love or the shepherd star to venus but the moon which appears to venus of the same bigness that venus appears to us is assigned to be the mother of love and shepherd star to venus for such names are only proper for a little brisk airy planet bright and shining as the goddess herself o blessed moon how happy art thou to preside over the amours of those inhabitants of venus who must be such masters of gallantry o oh, doubtless says i the very common people of venus are all celadons and sylvanders and their most trivial discourses are infinitely finer than any in clelia their very climate inspires love venus is much nearer than the earth is to the sun from whence she receives a more vigorous and active influence i find says the countess it is easy enough to guess at the inhabitants of venus they resemble what i have read of the moors of granada who were a little black people scorched with the sun witty full of fire very amorous much inclined to music and poetry and ever inventing masks and tournaments in honor of their mistresses pardon me madam says i you are little acquainted with the planet granada in all its glory was a perfect greenland to it and your gallant moors in comparison with that people were as stupid as so many laplanders but what do you think then of the inhabitants of mercury they are yet nearer to the sun and are so full of fire that they are absolutely mad i fancy they have no memory at all no more than most of the negroes that they make no reflections and what they do is by sudden starts and perfect haphazard in short mercury is the bedlam of the universe the sun appears to them much greater than it does to us because they are much nearer to it than we it sends them so vast and strong a light that the most glorious day here would be no more with them than a declining twilight i know not if they can distinguish objects but the heat to which they are accustomed is so excessive that they would be starved with cold in the torrid zone their year is but three months but we know not the exact length of their day because mercury is so little and so near the sun it is as it were lost in his rays and is very hardly discovered by the astronomers so that they cannot observe how it moves on its center but because it is so small they fancy it completes its motion in a little time so that by consequence the day there is very short and the sun appears to them like a vast fiery furnace at a little distance whose motion is prodigiously swift and rapid 
this is so much the better for them since tis evident they must long for night and during their night venus and the earth which must appear considerably big give light to them as for the other planets which are beyond the earth towards the firmament they appear less to them in mercury than they do to us here and they receive but little light from them perhaps none at all the fixed stars likewise seem less to them and some of them totally disappear which were i there i should esteem a very great loss i should be very uneasy to see this large convex studded with but few stars and those of the least magnitude and lustre what signifies the loss of a few fixed stars says the countess i pity em for the excessive heat they endure let us give em some relief and send mercury a few of the refreshing showers they have sometimes four months together in the hottest countries during their greatest extremity your fancy is good madam replied i but we will relieve em another way in china there are countries which are extremely hot by their situation yet in july and august are so cold that the rivers are frozen the reason is they are full of salt peter which being exhaled in great abundance by the excessive heat of the sun makes a perfect winter at midsummer we will fill the little planet with salt peter and let the sun shine as hot as he pleases and yet after all who knows but the inhabitants of mercury may have no occasion either for rain or saltpeter if it is a certain truth that nature never gives life to any creature but where that creature may live then through custom and ignorance of a better life those people may live happily after mercury comes the sun but there is no possibility of peopling it nor no room left for a wherefore by the earth which is inhabited we judge that other bodies of the same nature may be likewise inhabited but the sun is a body not like the earth or any of the planets the sun is the source or fountain of light which though it is sent from one planet to another and receive several alterations by the way yet all originally proceeds from the sun he draws from himself that precious substance which he emits from all sides and which reflects when it meets with a solid body and spreads from one planet to another those long and vast trains of light which cross strike through and intermingle in a thousand different fashions and make if i may so say the richest tissues in the world the sun likewise is placed in the centre from whence with most convenience he may equally distribute and animate by his heat it is then a particular body but what sort of body has often puzzled better heads than mine it was thought formerly a body of pure fire and that opinion passed current till the beginning of this age when they perceived several spots on its surface a little after they had discovered new planets of which hereafter these some said were the spots for those planets moving round the sun when they turned their dark half to us must necessarily hide part of it and had not the learned with these pretended planets made their court before to most of the princes in europe giving the name of this prince to one and of that prince to another planet i believe they would have quarrelled who should be master of these spots that they might have named them as they pleased 
i cannot approve that notion twas but t'other day says the countess you were describing the moon and called several places by the names of the most famous astronomers i was pleased with the fancy for since the princes have seized on the earth tis fit the philosophers who are as proud as the best of em should reserve the heavens for themselves without any competitors oh says i trouble not yourself the philosophers make the best advantage of their territories and if they part with the least star tis on very good terms but the spots on the sun are fallen to nothing tis now discovered that they are not planets but clouds streams or dross which rise upon the sun sometimes in a great quantity sometimes in less sometimes they are dark sometimes clear sometimes they continue a great while and sometimes they disappear as long it seems the sun is a liquid matter some think of melted gold which boils over as it were continually and by the force of its motion casts the scum or dross on its surface where it is consumed and others arise imagine then what strange bodies these are when some of them are as big as the earth what a vast quantity must there be of this melted gold and what must be the extent of this great sea of light and fire which they call the sun others say the sun appears through their telescopes full of mountains which vomit fire continually and are joined together like millions of etnas yet there are those who say these burning mountains are pure vision caused by a fault in the spectacles but what shall we credit if we must distrust our telescopes to which we owe the knowledge of so many new objects but let the sun be what it will it cannot be at all proper for habitation and what pity tis for how pleasant would it be you might then be at the centre of the universe where you would see all the planets turn regularly about you but now we know nothing but extravagant fancies because we don't stand in the proper place there is but one place in the world where the study or knowledge of the stars is easily obtained and what pity tis there is nobody there you forget yourself sure says she were you in the sun you would see nothing neither planets nor fixed stars does not the sun efface all so that could there be any inhabitants there they might justly think themselves the only people in nature i own says i my mistake i was thinking of the situation of the sun and not of the effect of its light i thank you for your correction but must take the boldness to tell you that you are in an error as well as myself for were there inhabitants in the sun they would not see at all either they could not bear the strength of its light or for want of a due distance they could not receive it so that things well considered all the people there must be stark blind which is another reason why the sun cannot be inhabited but let us pursue our voyage we are now arrived at the centre which is always the bottom or lowest place of what is round if we go on we must ascend we shall find mercury venus the earth the moon all the planets we have already visited the next is mars who has nothing curious that i know of his day is not quite an hour longer than ours but his year is twice as much as ours he is a little less than the earth 
and the sun seems not altogether so large and so bright to him as it appears to us but let us leave mars he is not worth our stay but what a pretty thing is jupiter with his four moons or yeomen of the guard they are four little planets that turn round him as our moon turns round us but why says she interrupting me must there be planets to turn round other planets that are no better than themselves i should think it would be more regular and uniform that all the planets little and great without any distinction should have one and the same motion round the sun ah madam says i if you did but know what descartes whirlpools or vortexes were whose name is terrible but their idea pleasant you would not ask as you do must my head says she smiling turn round to comprehend em or must i become a perfect fool to understand the mysteries of philosophy well let the world say what it will go on with your whirlpools i will says i and you shall see the whirlpools are worthy of these transports that then which we call a whirlpool or vortex is a mass of matter whose parts are separated or detach from one another yet have all one uniform motion and at the same time every one is allowed or has a particular motion of its own provided it follows the general motion thus a vortex of wind or whirlwind is an infinity of little particles of air which turn round all together and involve whatever they meet with you know the planets are borne up by the celestial matter which is prodigiously subtle and active so that this great mass or ocean of celestial matter which flows as far as from the sun to the fixed stars turns round and bears the planets along with it making them all turn after the same manner round the sun who possesses the center but in a longer or a shorter time according as they are farther or nearer in distance to it there is nothing to the very sun which does not turn but he turns on himself because he is just in the middle of this celestial matter and you must know by the way that were the earth in his place it must turn on itself as the sun does this is the great vortex of which the sun is lord yet at the same time the planets make little particular vortexes in imitation of that of the sun each of them in turning round the sun does at the same time turn round itself and makes a certain quantity of celestial matter turn round it likewise which is always prepared to follow the motion the planet gives it provided it is not diverted from its general motion this then is the particular vortex of the planet which pushes it as far as the strength of its motion reaches and if by chance a lesser planet falls into the vortex of a greater planet it is immediately borne away by the greater and is indispensably forced to turn round it though at the same time the great planet the little planet and the vortex which encloses them all turn round the sun twas thus at the beginning of the world when we made the moon follow us because she was within the reach of our vortex and therefore wholly at our disposal jupiter was stronger or more fortunate than we he had four little planets in his neighborhood and he brought them all four under his subjection 
and no doubt we though a principal planet had had the same fate had we been within the sphere of his activity he is ninety times bigger than the earth and would certainly have swallowed us into his vortex we had then been no more than a moon in his family when now we have one to wait on us so that you see the advantage of situation decides often all our good fortune but pray says she who can assure us we shall continue as we do now if we should be such fools as to go near jupiter or he so ambitious as to approach us what will become of us for if as you say the celestial matter is continually under this great motion it must needs agitate the planets irregularly sometimes drive em together and sometimes separate em luck is all says i we may win as well as lose and who knows but we should bring mercury and venus under our government they are little planets and cannot resist us but in this particular madam we need not hope or fear the planets keep within their own bounds and are obliged as formerly the kings of china were not to undertake new conquests have you not seen when you put water and oil together the oil swims atop and if to these two liquors you add a very little liquor the oil bears it up and it will not sink to the water but an heavier liquor of a just weight and it will pass through the oil which is too weak to sustain it and sink till it comes to the water which is strong enough to bear it up so that in this liquor composed of two liquors which do not mingle two bodies of an equal weight will naturally assume two different places the one will never ascend the other will never descend if we put still other liquors which do not mingle and throw other bodies on them it will be the same thing fancy then that the celestial matter which fills this great vortex has several resting places one by another whose weight are different like that of oil water and other liquors the planets too are of a different weight and consequently every planet settles in that place which has a just strength to sustain and keep it equilibrate so you see tis impossible it should ever go beyond i apprehend very well says the countess that these weights keep their stations regularly would to god our world were as well regulated and every one among us knew their proper place i am now in no fear of being overrun by jupiter and since he lets us alone in our vortex with our moon i don't envy him the four which he has did you envy him replied i you would do him wrong for he has no more than what he has occasion for at the distance he is from the sun his moons receive and send him but a very weak light it is true that as he turns upon himself in ten hours his nights by consequence are but five hours long so one would think there is no great occasion for four moons but there are other things to be considered here under the poles they have six months day and six months night because the poles are the two extremities of the earth the farthest removed from those places where the sun is over em in a perpendicular line the moon seems to keep almost the same course as the sun 
and if the inhabitants of the pole see the sun during one half of his course of a year and during the other half don't see him at all they see the moon likewise during one half of her course of a month that is she appears to em fifteen days but they don't see her during the other half jupiter's year is as much as twelve of ours so that there must be two opposite extremities in that planet where their night and their day are six years each a night six years long is a little disconsolate and tis for that reason i suppose they have four moons that which in regard to jupiter is uppermost finishes its course about him in seventeen days the second in seven the third three days and an half and the fourth in two and forty hours and though they are so unfortunate as to have six years night yet their course being exactly divided into halves they never pass above one and twenty hours wherein they don't see at least the last moon which is a great comfort in so tedious a darkness so that be where you will these four moons are sometimes the prettiest sight imaginable sometimes they rise all four together and then separate according to the inequality of their course sometimes they are all in their meridian ranged one above another sometimes you see em at equal distances on the horizon sometimes when two rise the other two go down oh how i should love to see their perpetual sport of eclipses for there is not a day passes but they eclipse the sun or one another and they are so accustomed to these eclipses in that planet that they are certainly objects of diversion and not of fear as with us end of chapter four part one chapter four part two of conversations on the plurality of worlds by bernard le Bouvier de fontenelle translated by william gardner this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Well, says the Countess, I hope you will people these four moons, though you say they are but little secondary planets appointed to give light to another planet during its night. Don't doubt it, replied I. These planets are not a jot the worse to be inhabited for being forced to turn round another planet of greater consequence. I would have then, says she, the people of these four moons to be so many colonies under Jupiter's government. They should, if it were possible, receive their laws and customs from him, and consequently render him a kind of homage, and not view his great planet without deference. Would it not be convenient too, says I, that they should send deputies with addresses to him, to assure him of their fidelity, for he has certainly a more absolute command over his moon than we have over ours though his power, after all, is but imaginary, and consists chiefly in making him afraid. For that moon which is nearest to him sees that he is three hundred and fifty times bigger than our moon appears to us. For in truth, he is so much bigger than she, he is also much nearer to them than our moon is to us, which makes him appear the greater. So that this formidable planet hangs continually over their heads, at a very little distance, and if the Gauls were afraid heretofore that the heavens would fall on them, I think the inhabitants of that moon may well be apprehensive that Jupiter will at some time or other overwhelm them. I fancy, says she, they are possessed with that fear because they are not concerned at eclipses. Everyone has their peculiar folly. We are afraid of an eclipse, and they that Jupiter will fall on their heads. It is very true, says I the inventor of the third system i told you of t'other night 
the famous Tycho Brahe, one of the greatest astronomers that ever was, did not apprehend the least danger from an eclipse when everybody else was under the greatest consternation. But what apprehensions do you think he entertained instead of them? This great man was so unaccountably superstitious, that if an hair but did cross him, or an old woman bolt upon him first at his coming out, he presently looked upon his journey to be ominous, shut himself up for that day, and would not meddle with the least business. It would be very unreasonable, replied she, after such a man could not redeem himself from the fear of eclipses without falling into some other foible as troublesome, that the inhabitants of that moon of Jupiter, whereof we were talking, should come off upon easier terms. But we will give them no quarter, they shall come under the general rule, and if they are free from one error, shall fall into another to put them upon equivalent. But as I don't trouble myself, because I can't guess what, pray clear another difficulty to me, which has given me some pain for several minutes. Pray tell me, if the earth be so little in comparison of Jupiter, whether his inhabitants do discover us. Indeed, I believe not, says I, for if we appear to him ninety times less than he appears to us, judge you if there be any possibility. Yet this we may reasonably conjecture, that there are astronomers in Jupiter, who after they have made the most curious telescopes, and taken the clearest night for their observations, may have discovered a little planet in the heavens, which they never saw before. If they publish their discovery, most people know not what they mean, or laugh at them for fools. Nay, the philosophers themselves will not believe them, for fear of destroying their own opinions. Yet some few may be a little curious. They continue their observations, discover the little planet again, and are now assured it is no vision. Then they conclude it has a motion round the sun, and after a thousand observations, find that it completes this motion in a year, and at last, thanks to the learned, they know in Jupiter that our earth is a world. Everybody runs to see it at the end of the telescope, though tis so little, tis hardly discovered. It must be pleasant, says she, to see the astronomers of both planets leveling their tubes at one another, and mutually asking, what world is that? What people inhabit it? Not so fast, neither, replied I. For though they may from Jupiter discover our Earth, yet they may not know us. That is, they don't in the least suspect it is inhabited, and should any one there chance to have such a fancy, he might be sufficiently ridiculed, if not prosecuted for it. For my part, I believe they have work enough to make discoveries on their own planet, not to trouble their heads with ours. And it is so large that if they have any such thing as navigation, their Christopher Columbus could never want employment. Why, I warrant you, they have not yet discovered the hundredth part of their planet. But if Mercury is so little, they are all, as it were, near neighbors, and tis but taking a walk to go round that planet. But if we don't appear to him in Jupiter, they cannot certainly discover Venus and Mercury, which are much less than the Earth, and at a greater distance. But in lieu of it, they see Mars, their own four moons, and Saturn with his. This, I think, is work enough for their astronomers, and nature has been so kind to conceal from them the rest of the universe. Do you think it a favor, then? says she. Yes, certainly, says I, for there are sixteen planets in this great vortex. Nature saves us the trouble of studying the motions of them all, and shows us but seven, which I think is very obliging, though we know not how to value the kindness, for we have recovered the other nine which were hid from us, and so render the science of astronomy much more difficult than nature designed it. If there are sixteen planets, says she, Saturn must have five moons, is very true, says I, and two of these five are but lately discovered. But there is somewhat that is more remarkable, since his year is thirty of ours, and there are consequently in him some countries where their night is fifteen years long. What can you imagine nature has invented to give light during so dreadful a night? Why, she has not only given Saturn five moons, but she has encompassed him round with a great circle or ring this being placed beyond the reach of the shadow which the body of that planet casts, reflects the light of the sun continually on those places where they cannot see the sun at all. I protest, 
says the countess this is very surprising and yet all is contrived in such great order that it is impossible not to think but nature took time to consider the necessities of all animate beings and that the disposing of these moons was not a work of chance for they are only divided among those planets which are farthest distant from the sun the earth jupiter saturn indeed it was not worth while to give any to mercury or venus they have too much light already and they account their nights as short as they are a greater blessing than their day but pray why has not mars a moon too it seems he has none though he is much farther than the earth from the sun it is very true says i no doubt but he has other helps though we don't know him you have seen the phosphorus both liquid and dry how it receives and imbibes the rays of the sun and what a great light it will cast in a dark place perhaps mars has many great high rocks which are so many natural phosphoruses which in the day take in a certain provision of light and return it again at night what think you madam is it not very pleasant when the sun is down to see those lighted rocks like so many glorious illuminations made without any art and which can do no manner of hurt by their heat besides there is a kind of bird in america that yields such a light you may read by it in the darkest night and who knows but mars may have great flocks of these birds that as soon as it is night disperse themselves into all parts and spread from their wings another day i am not at all contented says she with your rocks or your birds tis a pretty fancy indeed but tis a sign that there should be moons in mars since nature has given so many to saturn and jupiter and if all the other worlds that are distant from the sun have moons why should mars only be accepted ah madam says i when you are a little more dipped in philosophy you will find exceptions in the very best systems there are always some things that agree extremely well but then there are others that do not accord at all those you must leave as you found them if ever you intend to make an end we will do so by mars if you please and say no more of him but return to saturn what do you think of his great ring in the form of a semicircle that reaches from one end of the horizon to the other which reflecting the light of the sun performs the office of a continual moon and must we not inhabit this ring too says she smiling i confess says i in the humour i am in i could almost send colonies everywhere and yet i can't well plant any there it seems so irregular a habitation but for the five little moons they can't choose but be inhabited though some think this ring is a circle of moons which follow close to one another and have an equal motion and that the five little moons fell out of the circle how many worlds are there then in the vortex of saturn but let it be how it will the people in saturn live very miserably tis true this ring gives light to him but it must be a very poor one when the sun seems to him but a little pale star whose light and heat cannot but be very weak at so great a distance they say greenland is a perfect bagno in comparison of that planet and that they would expire with heat in our coldest countries you give me says she such an idea of saturn that makes me shake with cold and that of mercury puts me into a fever it cannot be otherwise replied i for the two worlds which are the extremities of this great vortex must be opposite in all things they must then says she be very wise in saturn for you told me they were all fools in mercury if they are not wise says i yet they have all the appearances of being very phlegmatic they are people that know not what it is to laugh they take a day's time to answer the least question you can ask them and are so very grave that were cato living among em they would think him a merry andrew it is odd to consider says she that the inhabitants of mercury are all life and the inhabitants of saturn quite contrary but among us some are brisk and some are dull it is i suppose because our earth is placed in the middle of the other worlds and so we participate of both extremes there is no fixed or determined character some are made like the inhabitants of mercury some like those of saturn we are a mixture of the several kinds that are found in the rest of the planets why says i don't you approve of the idea 
methinks it is pleasant to be composed of such a fantastical assembly that one would think we were collected out of different worlds we need not travel when we see the other worlds in epitome at home i am sure says the countess we have one great convenience in the situation of our world it is not so hot as mercury and venus nor so cold as jupiter or saturn and our country is so justly placed that we have no excess either of heat or cold i have heard of a philosopher who gave thanks to nature that he was born a man and not a beast a greek and not a barbarian and for my part i render thanks that i am seated in the most temperate planet of the universe and in one of the most temperate regions of that planet you have more reason says i to give thanks that you were young and not old that you were young and handsome and not young and ugly that you were young handsome and a frenchwoman and not young handsome and an italian these are other guest subjects for your thanks than the situation of your vortex or the temperature of your country pray sir says she let me give thanks for all things to the very vortex in which i am planted our proportion of happiness is so very small that we should lose none but improve continually what we have and be grateful for everything though never so common or inconsiderable if nothing but exquisite pleasure will serve us we must wait a long time and be sure to pay too dear for it at last i wish says i that philosophy was the pleasure you propose that when you think of vortexes you would not forget an humble servant of your ladyships i esteem it a pleasure says she while it diverts me with something new but no longer i will engage for it till to-morrow replied i for the fixed stars are beyond what you have yet seen end of chapter four part two chapter five part one of conversations on the plurality of worlds by Bernard Le Bovier de Fontenelle. Translation by William Gardner. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The fifth evening's conversation. That the fixed stars are so many suns, every one of which gives light to a world. The Countess was very impatient to know what would become of the fixed stars. Are they inhabited? says she, as the planets are? or are they not inhabited at all or in short what shall we do with them you may soon guess says i the fixed stars cannot be less distant from the earth than fifty millions of leagues nay if you anger an astronomer he will set them farther the distance from the sun to the farthest planet is nothing in comparison of the distance from the sun or from the earth to the fixed stars it is almost beyond arithmetic you see their light is bright and shining and did they receive it from the sun it must needs be very weak after a passage of fifty millions of leagues then judge how much it is wasted by reflection for it comes back again as far to us so that forwards and backwards here are an hundred millions of leagues for it to pass and tis impossible it should be so clear and strong as the light of a fixed star which cannot but proceed from itself so that in a word all the fixed stars are luminous bodies in themselves, and so many suns. I perceive, says the countess, where you would carry me. You were going to tell me that if the fixed stars are so many suns, and our sun the center of a vortex that turns round him, why may not every fixed star be the center of a vortex that turns round the fixed star? Our sun enlightens the planets. Why may not every fixed star have planets to which they give light? you have said it replied i and i will not contradict you but you have made the universe so large says she that i know not where i am or what will become of me what is it all to be divided into vortexes confusedly one among another is every star the centre of a vortex as big as ours is that vast space which comprehends our sun and planets but an inconsiderable part of the universe and are there as many such spaces as there are fixed stars i protest it is dreadful the idea confounds and overpowers me and for my part replied i it gives me satisfaction 
when the heavens were a little blue arch stuck with stars methought the universe was too straight and close i was almost stifled for want of air but now it is enlarged in height and breadth and a thousand and a thousand vortexes taken in i begin to breathe with more freedom and think the universe to be incomparably more magnificent than it was before nature has spared no cost even to profuseness and nothing can be so glorious as to see such a prodigious number of vortexes whose several centres are possessed by a particular sun which makes the very planets turn round it the inhabitants of a planet of one of these innumerable vortexes see on all sides these luminous centres of the vortex with which they are encompassed but perhaps they don't see the planets who receiving but a faint light from their sun can't send it beyond their own world you present me with a kind of perspective of so vast a length that no eye can reach to the end of it i plainly see the inhabitants of the earth and you have made me discover those who dwell on the moon and in other planets of our vortex these inhabitants indeed i can see pretty plainly but i don't see em so clearly as those of the earth after these we come to the inhabitants of the planets which are in the other vortexes but they are sunk into so great a depth that though i do all i can to see them yet i must confess i can hardly perceive em by the expression you use in speaking of em they seem to be almost annihilated you ought then to call em the inhabitants of one of those innumerable vortexes we ourselves for whom the same expression serves must confess that we scarce know where we are in the midst of so many worlds for my own part i begin to see the earth so fearfully little that i believe from henceforth i shall never be concerned at all for anything that we so eagerly desire to make ourselves great that we are always designing always troubling and harassing ourselves is certainly because we are ignorant what these vortexes are but now i hope my new lights will in part justify my laziness and when any one reproaches me with my indolence i will answer ah did you but know what the fixed stars are it was not fit says i that alexander should know what they were for a certain author who maintains that the moon is inhabited very gravely tells us that aristotle from whom no truth could be long concealed must necessarily be of an opinion backed with so much reason but yet he never durst acquaint alexander with the secret lest he should run mad with despair when he knew there was another world which he could not conquer with much more reason then was this mystery of vortexes and fixed stars kept secret in alexander's time for though they had been known in those days yet it had been but an ill way of making his court to have said anything of them to that ambitious prince for my part i that know him am not a little troubled to find myself not one jot the wiser for all the knowledge i have of em the most they can do according to your way of reasoning is but to cure people of their ambition and their unquiet restless humour which are diseases i am not at all troubled with i confess i am guilty of so much weakness as to be in love with what is beautiful that's my distemper and i am confident the vortexes can never cure it what if the other worlds render ours so very little they cannot spoil fine eyes or a pretty mouth their value is still the same in spite of all the worlds that can possibly exist this love replied the countess smiling is a strange thing let the world go how twill tis never in danger there is no system can do it any harm but tell me freely is your system true pray conceal nothing from me i will keep your secret very faithfully it seems to have for its foundation but a slight probability which is that if a fixed star be in itself a luminous body like the sun then by consequence it must as the sun is be the centre and soul of a world and have its planets turning round about it but is there an absolute necessity it must be so hear me madam says i since we are in the humour of mingling amorous follies with our most serious discourse i must tell you that in love and the mathematics people reason alike allow never so little to a lover yet presently after you must grant him more nay more and more which will at last go a great way in like manner grant but a mathematician one little principle he immediately draws a consequence from it to which you must necessarily assent and from this consequence another 
till he leads you so far, whether you will or no, that you have much ado to believe him. These two sorts of people, lovers and mathematicians, will always take more than you give them. You grant that when two things are alike in one another in all visible respects, it is possible they may be like one another in those respects that are not visible, if you have not some good reason to believe otherwise. Now this way of arguing have I made use of. The moon, says I, is inhabited because she is like the earth, and the other planets are inhabited because they are like the moon. I find the fixed stars to be like our sun. Therefore, I attribute to them what is proper to that. You are now gone too far to be able to retreat. Therefore, you must go forward with a good grace. But, says the countess, if you build upon this resemblance or likeness, which is between our sun and the fixed stars, then to the people of another great vortex, our sun must appear no bigger than a small fixed star, and can be seen only when tis night with them. Without doubt, madam, says I, it must be so. Our sun is much nearer to us than the suns of other vortexes, and therefore its light makes a much greater impression on our eyes than theirs do. We see nothing but the light of our own sun, and when we see that, it darkens and hinders us from seeing any other light. But in another great vortex there is another sun which rules and governs, and in its turn extinguishes the light of our sun, which is never seen there but in the night with the rest of the other suns, that is, the fixed stars. With them our sun is fastened to the great arched roof of heaven, where it makes a part of some bear or bull. For the planets which turn round about it, our earth for example, as they are not seen at so vast a distance, so nobody doth so much as dream of them. All the suns then are day suns in their own vortexes, but night suns in other vortexes. In his own world or sphere, every sun is single, and there is but one to be seen, but everywhere else they serve only to make a number. May not the worlds, replied the countess, notwithstanding this great resemblance between them, differ in a thousand other things, for though they may be alike in one particular, they may differ infinitely in others. It is certainly true, says I, but the difficulty is to know wherein they differ. One vortex has many planets that turn round about its sun. Another vortex has but a few. In one vortex there are inferior or less planets, which turn about those that are greater. In another, perhaps, there are no inferior planets. Here, all the planets are got round about their sun, in form of a little squadron, beyond which is a great void space which reaches to the neighboring vortexes. In another place, the planets take their course towards the outside of their vortex, and leave the middle void. There may be vortexes also quite void, without any planets at all. Others may have their sun not exactly in their center, and that sun may so move as to carry its planets along with it. Others may have planets which in regard of their sun ascend and descend according to the change of their equilibration, which keeps them suspended. In short, what variety can you wish for? But I think I have said enough for a man that was never out of his own vortex. It is not so much, replied the countess, considering what a multitude of worlds there are. What you have said is sufficient for five or six, and from hence I see thousands. What would you say, madam, if I should tell you there are many more fixed stars than those you see, and that an infinite number are discovered with glasses which are not perceptible to our eyesight? In only one constellation, where it may be we count twelve or fifteen, there are as many to be found as usually appear in the whole hemisphere. I submit, says the countess, and beg your pardon, you quite confound me with worlds and vortexes. Oh, madam, I have a great deal more to tell you, replied I. You see that whiteness in the sky, which some call the Milky Way. Can you imagine what that is? Tis nothing but an infinity of small stars, not to be seen by our eyes, because they are so very little, and they are sown so thick, one by another, that they seem to be one continued whiteness. I wish you had a glass to see this ant hill of stars, and this cluster of worlds, if I may so call them. They are in some sort like the Maldive Islands, those twelve thousand banks of sand, separated only by narrow channels of the sea, which a man may as easily leap over as a ditch. 
so near together are the vortexes of the milky way that i presume the people in one world may talk and shake hands with those of another at least i believe the birds of one world may easily fly into its other and that pigeons may be trained up to carry letters as they do in the levant these little worlds are accepted out of that general rule by which one sun in his own vortex as soon as he appears effaces the light of all other foreign suns if you were in one of these little vortexes of the milky way your sun would not be much nearer to you and consequently would not make any much more sensible impression on your eyes than a hundred thousand other suns of the neighboring vortexes you would then see your heaven shine bright with an infinite number of fires close to one another and but a little distant from you so that though you should lose the light of your own particular sun yet there would still remain visible suns enough beside your own to make your night as light as day at least the difference would hardly be perceived for the truth is you would never have any night at all the inhabitants of these worlds accustomed to perpetual brightness would be strangely astonished if they should be told that there are a miserable sort of people who where they live have very dark nights and when tis day with them they never see more than one sun certainly they would think nature had very little kindness for us and would tremble with horror to think what a sad condition we are in i don't ask you says the countess whether in those worlds of the milky way there are any moons i see they would be of no use to those principal planets which have no night and move in spaces too straight and narrow to cumber themselves with the baggage of inferior planets yet pray take notice that by your liberal multiplication of worlds you have started an objection not easily answered the vortexes whose suns we see touch the vortex in which we are and if it be true that vortexes are round how then can so many bowls or globes all touch one single one i would fain imagine how this may be done but cannot reconcile it to myself madam says i you shew a great deal of wit in raising this doubt and likewise in not being able to resolve it for in itself the thing is extreme difficult and in the same manner you conceive it no answer can be given to it and he must be a fool who goes about to find answers to objections which are unanswerable if our vortex had the form of a die it would have six squares or flat faces and would be far from being round and upon every one of these squares might be placed a vortex of the same figure but if instead of these six square faces it had twenty fifty or a thousand then might a thousand vortexes be placed upon it one upon every flat and you know very well that the more flat faces any body has on its outside the nearer it approaches to roundness just as a diamond cut face-wise on every side if the faces be very many and little it will look as round as a pearl of the same bigness tis in this manner that the vortexes are round they have an infinite number of faces on their outside and every one of them has upon it another vortex these faces are not all equal and alike but here some are greater and there are some less the least faces of our vortex for example answer to the milky way and sustain all those little worlds when two vortexes are supported by the two next flats on which they stand if they leave beneath any void space between them as it must often happen nature who is an excellent housewife and suffers nothing to be useless presently fills up this void space with a little vortex or two perhaps with a thousand which never incommode the others and become one two or a thousand worlds more so that there may be many more worlds than our vortex has flat faces to hear of i will lay a good wager that though these little worlds were made only to be thrown into the corners of the universe which otherwise would have been void and useless and though they are unknown to other worlds which they touch yet they are well satisfied with their being what they are these are the little worlds whose suns are not to be discovered but with a telescope and whose number is prodigious to conclude all these vortexes are joined to one another in so admirable a manner that every one turns round about his sun without changing place every one has such a turn as is most easy and agreeable to its own situation they take hold of one another like the wheels of a watch and mutually help one another's motion and yet tis true that they act contrary to one another 
every world as some say is like a football made of a bladder covered with leather which sometimes swells of its own accord and would extend itself if it were not hindered but this swelling world being pressed by the next to it returns to its first figure then swells again and is again depressed and some affirm that the reason why the fixed stars give a twinkling and trembling light and sometimes seem not to shine at all is because their vortexes perpetually push and press our vortex and ours again continually repulses theirs end of chapter five part one chapter five part two of conversations on the plurality of worlds by bernard le bouvier de fontenelle translated by william gardner this librivox recording is in the public domain i am in love with these fancies says the countess i am pleased with these footballs which swell every moment and sink again and with these worlds which are continually striving and pushing one another but above all i am pleased to see how this jostling keeps up the trade of light which is certainly the only correspondence that is between them no no madam says i light is not their sole commerce the neighboring worlds sometimes send visits to us and that in a very magnificent and splendid manner there come comets to us from thence adorned with bright shining hair venerable beards or majestic tails these says the countess are ambassadors whose visits may be well spared since they serve only to fright us they scare only children says i with their extraordinary trains but indeed the number of such children is nowadays very great comets are nothing but planets which belong to a neighboring vortex they move towards the outside of it but perhaps this vortex being differently pressed by those vortexes which encompass it above it is rounder than below and the lower part is still towards us these planets which have begun to move in a circle above are not aware that below their vortex will fail them because it is as it were broken therefore to continue the circular motion it is necessary that they enter into another vortex which we will suppose is ours and that they cut through the outsides of it they appear to us very high and are much higher than saturn and according to our system it is absolutely necessary they should be so high for reasons that signify nothing to our present subject from saturn downwards to the other side of our vortex there is a great void space without any planets our adversaries often ask us to what purpose this void space serves but let them not trouble themselves any more i have found a use for it tis the apartment of those strange planets which come into our world i understand you says she we don't suffer them to come into the heart of our vortex among our own planets but we receive them as the grand seigneur does the ambassadors that are sent to him he will not shew them so much respect as to let them lodge in Constantinople, but quarters them in one of the suburbs of the city. Madam, says I, we in the Ottomans agree likewise in this, that as we receive ambassadors but never send any, so we never send any of our planets into the worlds that are next us. By this, says she, it appears that we are very proud. However, I don't yet very well know what I am to believe these foreign planets with their tails and their beards have a terrible countenance it may be they are sent to affront us but ours that are of another make if they should get into other worlds are not so proper to make people afraid their beards and their tails madam says i are not real they are phenomena and but mere appearances these foreign planets differ in nothing from ours but entering into our vortex they seem to us to have tails or beards by a certain sort of illumination which they receive from the sun and which has not been yet well explained but tis certain that is but a kind of illumination and when i am able i will tell you how tis done i wish then says she that our saturn would go take a tail and beard in another vortex and fright all the inhabitants of it that done i would have him come back again leaving his terrible accoutrements behind him and taking his usual place amongst our other planets fall to his ordinary business tis better for him says i not to go out of our vortex i have told you how rude and violent the shock is when two vortexes jostle one another 
a poor planet must needs be terribly shaken and its inhabitants in no better condition we think ourselves very unhappy when a comet appears but tis the comet that is in an ill case i don't believe that says she it brings all its inhabitants with it in very good health there can be nothing so diverting as to change vortexes we that never go out of our own lead but a dull life if the inhabitants of a comet had but the wit to foresee the time when they were to come into our world they that had already made the voyage could tell their neighbors beforehand what they would see they could tell them that they would discover a planet with a great ring about it meaning our saturn they would also say you shall see another planet which has four little ones to wait on it and perhaps some of them resolved to observe the very moment of their entering into our world would presently cry out a new sun a new sun as sailors used to cry land land you have no reason then says i to pity the inhabitants of a comet yet i suppose you will think their condition lamentable that inhabit a vortex whose sun comes in time to be quite extinguished and consequently who live in eternal night how cried the countess can suns be put out yes without doubt says i for people some thousand years ago saw fixed stars in the sky which are now no more to be seen these were suns which have lost their light and certainly there must be a strange desolation in their vortexes and a general mortality over all the planets for what can people do without a sun this is a dismal fancy says the countess i would not if i could help it let it come into my head i will tell you if you please replied i what is the opinion of learned astronomers as to this particular they think that the fixed stars which have disappeared are not quite extinguished but that they are half suns that is they have one half dark and the other half light and turning round upon their own axis or centre they sometimes shew us their light side and afterwards turning to us their dark side we see them no more to oblige you madam i will be of this opinion because it is not so harsh as the other though i cannot make it good but in relation to some certain stars because as some have lately observed those stars have their regulated times of appearing and disappearing otherwise there could be no such things as half suns but what shall we say of stars which totally disappear and never shew themselves again after they have finished their course of turning round upon their own axis you are too just madam to oblige me to believe that stars are half suns however i will try once more what i can do in favour of your opinion the suns are not extinct they are only sunk so low into the immense depth of heaven that we cannot possibly see them in this case the vertex follows his sun and all's well again tis true that the greatest part of the fixed stars have not this motion by which they remove themselves so far from us because at other times they might return again nearer to us and we should see them sometimes greater and sometimes less which never happens but we will suppose that none but the little light and most active vortexes which slip between the others make certain voyages after which they return again while the main body of vortexes remain unmoved tis likewise very strange that some fixed stars shew themselves to us spending a great deal of time in appearing and disappearing and at last totally and entirely disappear half suns would appear again at their set and regulated time but suns which should be sunk low into the depths of heaven would disappear but once and not appear again for a vast space of time now madam declare your opinion boldly must not these stars of necessity be suns which are so much darkened as not to be visible to us yet afterwards shine again and at last are wholly extinct how can a sun says the countess be darkened and quite extinguished when it is in its own nature a foundation of light it may be done madam says i with all the ease in the world if descartes opinion be true that our sun has spots not whether these spots be scum or thick mists or what you please they may thicken and unite till at last they cover the sun with a crust which daily grows thicker and then farewell sun we have hitherto scaped pretty well but tis said that the sun for some whole years together has looked very pale for example the year after caesar's death it was this crust that then began to grow but the force of the sun broke through and dissipated it 
had it continued we had been all lost people you make me tremble replied the countess and now i know the fatal consequences of the sun's paleness i believe instead of going every morning to the glass to see how i look myself i shall cast my eyes up to heaven to see whether or no the sun looks pale oh madam says i there is a great deal of time required to ruin a world i grant it says she yet tis but time that is required i confess it says i all this immense mass of matter that composes the universe is in perpetual motion no part of it excepted and since every part is moved you may be sure that changes must happen sooner or later but still in time's proportion to the effect the ancients were pleasant gentlemen to imagine that the celestial bodies were in their own nature unchangeable because they observed no alteration in them but they did not live long enough to confirm their opinion by their own experience they were boys in comparison of us give me leave madam to explain myself by an allegory if roses which last but a day could write histories and leave memoirs one to another and if the first rose should draw an exact picture of his gardener and after fifteen thousand rose ages it should be left to other roses and so on still to those that should succeed without any change in it should the roses hereupon say we have every day seen the same gardener and in the memory of roses none ever saw any gardener but this he is still the same he was and therefore certainly he will die as we do for there is no change at all in him would not these roses madam talk very foolishly and yet there would be more reason in their discourse than there was in what the ancients said concerning celestial bodies and though even to this very day there should appear no visible change in the heavens and the matter of which they are made should have all the signs of an eternal duration without any change yet i would not believe them unchangeable till i had the experience of many more ages ought we who last but a moment to make our continuance the mensurate duration of any other being tis not so easy a matter to be eternal to have lasted many ages of men one after another is no sign of immortality truly says the countess i find the worlds are far from being able to pretend to it i will not do him so much honour as to compare him to the gardener that lives so much longer than the roses i begin to think him like the roses themselves which blow one day and die the next for now i understand that if old stars disappear new ones will come in their room because every species must preserve itself no species madam says i can totally perish some perhaps will tell you that such new stars are suns which return to our sight again after they have been a long time hid from us in the profundity of heaven others may tell you they are suns cleared from that thick crust which once covered them if i should think all this possible yet i likewise believe that the universe may be framed in such a manner that from time to time it may produce new suns why may not that matter which is proper to make a sun be dispersed here and there and gather itself again at long run into one certain place and lay the foundation of a new world i am very much inclined to believe such new productions because they suit with that glorious and admirable idea which i have of the works of nature can we think that wise nature knows no more than the secret of making herbs and plants live and die by a continual revolution i am verily persuaded and are not you so too madam that nature without much cost or pains can put the same secret in practice upon the world i now find says the countess the worlds the heavens and celestial bodies so subject to change that i am come to myself again to recover ourselves the better replied i let us say no more of these matters we are arrived at the very roof and top of all the heavens and to tell you whether there be any stars beyond it you must have an abler astronomer than i am you may place worlds there or no worlds as you please tis the philosopher's empire to describe those vast invisible countries which are and are not or are such as he pleases to make them it is enough for me to have carried your mind as far as you can see with your eyes well i have now says the countess the system of the universe in my head how learned am i become indeed madam says i 
you are pretty knowing and with this advantage of believing or disbelieving anything i have said all the recompense i desire for the pains i have taken is that you would never look upon the sun the heaven or the stars without thinking on me end of chapter five part two chapter six part one of conversations on the plurality of worlds this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by avai in april two thousand nineteen conversations on the plurality of worlds by bernard le bouvier de fontenelle Translated by William Gardiner The Sixth Evening's Conversation Never Before Translated Some new observations which confirm those in the preceding discourses and several late discoveries which have been made in the heavens. It was a considerable time since the Countess and I had any talk of the planetary worlds, and it was so long indeed that we began to forget we ever had held any discourse on that subject when i went one day to visit her i came in just as two gentlemen of wit and character in the world had taken their leaves of her well says she the very moment she perceived me you see what a visit i have been receiving and i protest it has given me some room to suspect that it has been in your power to impose upon my judgment i should be very proud madam replied i if i could flatter myself with such a power because i look upon it to be the hardest task any one could attempt as hard as it is says the countess i am afraid you have done it i do not know how it came about but the conversation turned upon the plurality of worlds with my two friends who are just gone I am not certain if they did not introduce the discourse with a malicious design. I made no scruple to tell them directly that all the planets were inhabited. One of them replied he was very well satisfied I did not believe a word of it, and I, with all the simplicity imaginable, maintained that it was my real opinion. He still looked upon it as a piece of dissimulation designed to divert the company, and i thought what made him so positive that i did not believe my own sentiments was that he had too high an opinion of me to conceive that i could entertain so extravagant a notion as for the other gentlemen who had not altogether that esteem for me they took me at my word for god's sake why did you put a thing in my head which people that value me cannot think i maintain seriously nay madam says i but why would you maintain it seriously among a set of people who i am sure never entered into a way of reasoning which had the least cast of seriousness must we entrust the inhabitants of the planets so lightly we should content ourselves with being a little select number of advocates for them and not communicate our mysteries to the vulgar how says the countess do you call my two last visitants the vulgar they may have wit enough says i but they never reason at all and your reasoners who are a severe set of people will make no difficulty of sorting them with the vulgar on the other side these men of fire revenge themselves by ridiculing the reasoners and think it is a very just principle in nature that every species despises what it wants it were right if it was possible to conform ourselves to every species and it had been much better for you to have rallied on the inhabitants of the planets with your two friends because they are better at raillery than reasoning which they never make use of you had then come off with their joint esteem and the planets had not lost a single inhabitant by it would you have had me sacrifice the truth to a jest replied the countess and is that all the conscience you have I own to you, says I, that I have no great zeal for these sorts of truths, and I will sacrifice them with all my soul to the last conveniences of company. For instance, I see what is, and always will be, the reason why the opinion of the planets being inhabited 
is not received so probable as it really is the planets always present themselves to our view as bodies which emit light and not at all like great plains and meadows we should readily agree that plains and meadows were inhabited but for luminous bodies to be so too there is no ground to believe it reason may come and tell us over and over that there are plains and meadows in these planets but reason comes a day too late one glance of our eyes has had its effect before her we will not hear a word she says the planets must be luminous bodies and what sort of inhabitants should they have our imagination of course would presently represent their figures to us it is what she cannot do and the shortest way is to believe that there are no such beings would you have me for the establishment of these planetary people whose interests are far from touching me go to attack those formidable powers called senses and imagination it is an enterprise would require a good stock of courage and we cannot easily prevail on men to substitute their reason in the place of their eyes i sometimes meet with reasonable people enough who are willing after a thousand demonstrations to believe that the planets are so many earths but their belief is not such as it would be if they had not seen them under a different appearance they still remember the first idea they entertained and they cannot well recover themselves from it it is these sort of people who in believing our opinion seem to do it a courtesy and only favor it for the sake of a certain pleasure which its singularity gives them well says the countess interrupting me and is not this enough for an opinion which is but rarely probable you would be very much surprised says i if i should tell you probable is a very modest term is it simply probable that such a one as alexander ever was you hold it very certain that there was and upon what is this certainty founded because you have all the proofs which you could desire in a like matter and there does not the least subject for doubt present itself to suspend or arrest your determination for else you never could see this alexander and you have not one mathematical demonstration that there ever was such a man now what would you say if the inhabitants of the planets were almost in the very same case we cannot pretend to make you see them and you cannot insist upon the demonstration here as you would in a mathematical question but you have all the proofs you could desire in a like matter the entire resemblance of the planets with the earth which is inhabited the impossibility of conceiving any other use for which they were created the fecundity and magnificence of nature the certain regards she seems to have had to the necessities of their inhabitants as in giving moons to those planets remote from the sun and more moons still to those yet more remote and what is still very material there are all things to be said on this side and nothing on the other and you cannot comprehend the least subject for a doubt unless you will take the eyes and understanding of the vulgar in short supposing that these inhabitants of the planets really are they could not declare themselves by more marks or marks more sensible and after this you are to consider whether you are willing not to take their case to be more than purely probable but you would not have me replies the countess look upon this to be as certain as that there was such a man as alexander not altogether madam says i for though we have as many proofs touching the inhabitants of the planets as we can have in the situation we are yet the number of these proofs is not great i must renounce these planetary inhabitants replies she interrupting me for i can't conceive how to rank them in my imagination there is no absolute certainty of them and yet there is more than a probability so that i am confounded in my notions ah madam says i never put yourself out of conceit with them for that the most common and ordinary clocks show the hours but those are wrought with more art and nicety which show the minutes just so your ordinary capacities are sensible of the difference betwixt the simple probability 
and a complete certainty but tis only your fine spirits that discern the exact proportions of certainty or probability and can mark if i may use the phrase the minutes in their sentiments now place the inhabitants of the planets a little below alexander but above i can tell how many points of history which are not so clearly proved i believe this position will do well i love order says the countess and you oblige me in ranging my ideas for me but pray why didn't you take this care before because says i should you believe the inhabitants of the planets either a little more or less than they deserve there will be no great damage in it i'm sure that you don't believe the motion of the earth so fully as it ought to be believed and have you much reason to complain on that score oh for that matter replies she i have discharged myself well you have nothing to reproach me with on that account for i firmly believe that the earth turns and yet says i madam i have not given you the strongest reasons in proving it ah traitor replies the countess to make me believe things upon feeble proofs then you did not think me worthy of believing upon substantial reasons i only proved things said i upon little engaging reasons and such as were adapted to your peculiar use should i have conjured up as strong and solid arguments as if i had been to attack a doctor in the science yes says the countess pray take me for a doctor from this moment and let me have your additional demonstrations of the earth's moving with all my heart says i madam and i own the proof pleases me strangely perhaps because i think it was of my own finding yet it is so good and natural that i must not presume positively to have been the inventor of it it is most certain that if a learned man was puzzled and desired to make replications to it he would be obliged to hold forth at large which is the only method in the world to confound a learned man we must grant that all the celestial bodies in four and twenty hours turn round the earth or that the earth turning on itself imparts this motion to all the celestial bodies but that they really have this revolution in four and twenty hours round the earth is a matter which has the least appearance in the world though the absurdity does not presently appear to our view all the planets certainly make their great revolution about the sun but these revolutions of theirs are unequal according to the distances of the respective planets from the sun for the most remote ones make their course in larger time which is most agreeable to nature the same order is observed among the little secondary planets in turning about a great one the four moons of jupiter and the five of saturn make their circles in more or less time round their great planet according as they are more or less remote besides it is certain that the planets have motions upon their own centres and these motions likewise are unequal we cannot well tell how to account for this inequality whether it proceeds from the different magnitudes of the planets or on the different swiftness of the particular vortexes which enclose them and the liquid matters in which they are sustained but in short the inequality is most undoubted and such is the order of nature in general that whatever is common to many things is found at the same time to vary in some different particulars i understand you says the countess interrupting me and i think there's a great deal of reason in what you say i'm entirely of your mind if the planets turned about the earth they would do it in unequal spaces of time according to their distances as they do about the sun is not that the meaning of what you are saying exactly madam says i their unequal distances with respect to the earth their different magnitudes and the different rapidity of the particular vortexes enclosing them should consequently produce differences in their pretended motion round the earth as well as in all their other motions and the fixed stars 
which are at such a prodigious distance from us and so much elevated above everything that can take a general motion round us at least which are situated in a place whence this motion should be very much weakened would there not be a very great appearance that they did not turn at all about us in four and twenty hours as the moon does who is so near us and should not comets which are strangers in our vortex and which run courses so differing one from another and with such unequal rapidity be excused from turning round us in the same space of four and twenty hours but no matter fixed stars and comets and all must turn round the earth in four and twenty hours yet if there were some minutes of difference in these motions we might be contented and they all must make them with the most exact equality or rather the only exact equality which is in the world and not one minute more or less allowed in reality this matter is strangely to be suspected End of chapter 6, part 1chapter six part two of conversations on the plurality of worlds this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in april two thousand nineteen conversations on the plurality of worlds by bernard le bouvier de fontenelle translated by william gardiner Chapter Six, Part Two. Oh, says the Countess, since tis possible that this grand equality should be only in our imagination, I'm entirely convinced it is derived only from thence. I'm very well pleased that any which is against the genius of nature should fall entirely upon ourselves, and that she should stand discharged, though at our expense. For my part, says i i am such a foe to a perfect equality that i cannot even allow that all the turns which the earth every day makes on herself should be precisely in four and twenty hours and always equal one to another i should be very much inclined to think that there are differences differences cried the countess why do not our pendulums mark an entire equality oh says i to your pendulums i must object for they cannot be altogether just and sometimes when they are in showing us that one circuit of twenty-four hours is longer or shorter than another we should rather be inclined to believe them irregular than to suspect the earth of any irregularity in her revolutions what a pleasant respect is this we have for her I would no more depend on the earth than on a pendulum and the very same casualties almost which will disorder the one will make the other irregular only i believe there must be some more time allowed for the earth than a pendulum to be visibly put out of order and that's all the advantage we can give on her side but might she not by degrees draw nearer to the sun and there finding herself in a situation where the matter is more agitated and the motion more rapid she will in less time make her double revolution more about the sun and herself so consequently her years and days will be much shortened but not to be perceived because we must still go on to divide the years into three hundred and sixty-five days and the days into twenty-four hours so that without living longer than we do now we shall live more years and on the other hand as the earth shall withdraw from the sun we shall live fewer years than we do now and yet have our lives of the same extent there is a great deal of probability says the countess that whenever it falls out so long successions of ages will make but very little differences i agree with you madam replied i the conduct of nature is very nice and she has a method of bringing about all things by degrees which are not sensible but in very obvious and easy changes we are scarce able to perceive the change of the seasons and for some others which are made with a certain deliberation 
they do not fail to escape our observance however all is in a perpetual whirl and not so much as the lady's face in the moon which was discovered with telescope within this twenty years but what is grown considerably old she had a good tolerable countenance but now her cheeks are sunk her nose grown long and her chin and forehead meet so that all her graces are vanished and age has made her a terrible spectacle what a story do you tell me says the countess interrupting me tis no imposition madam replied i they have perceived in the moon a particular figure which had the air of a woman's head jetting out of rocks and it is owing to some changes that have happened there some pieces of mountains have mouldered away and left us to discover three points which can only serve to make up the forehead nose and chin of an old woman well says she but don't you think it is some destiny that had a particular spite to beauty and very justly it was this female head which she would attack above all the moon perhaps in recompense replied i the changes which happen upon our earth dress out some face which the people in the moon see i mean something like what we conceive a face in the moon for every one bestows on objects those ideas of which they themselves are full our astronomers see on the surface of the moon the faces of women and maybe if the ladies were to make their speculations they would discern the resemblance of fine men's faces for my part madam i don't know whether i should not fancy your ladyship's charms there i protest says she i can't help being obliged to any one who should find me there but to come back to what you were mentioning just now do any considerable changes affect the earth in all appearance they do replied i our fables tell us that hercules with his hands split asunder the two mountains called kelpi and abila which stand betwixt Africa and spain stopped the ocean from flowing there and that immediately the sea rushed with violence over the land and made that great gulf which we call the mediterranean now this is not wholly fabulous but a history of those remote times which has been disguised either from the ignorance of the people or through the love they had for the marvellous the two most ancient frailties of mankind that hercules should separate two mountains with his two hands is absolutely incredible but that in the time of one hercules or other for there were fifty of that name the ocean should force down two mountains not so strong as others in the world and perhaps through the assistance of some earthquake and so take his course betwixt europe and Africa gives me no manner of pain to believe what a notable spot might the lunar inhabitants all of the sudden discover on our earth for you know madam that seas are spots it is not less the common opinion that sicily was disjoined from italy and cyprus from syria there are sometimes new islands formed in the seas earthquakes have swallowed up mountains others have rose and have altered the course of the planets the philosophers give us apprehensions that the kingdoms of naples and sicily which are countries laid upon great subterranean vaults full of sulphur will one day sink in when those vaults shall no longer be able to resist the flames which they contain and that this time exhale at vents to wit vesuvius and etna is not here enough to diversify the sight which we give to the people in the moon i had much rather says the countess that we disgusted them with the same object always than diverted them with the swallowing up of provinces i don't know replied i if within this little time there have not been several burnt up in jupiter what provinces burnt up in jupiter cries the countess upon my word that would be considerable news very considerable says i madam we have remarked this year in jupiter a long trail of light more glaring than the rest of that planet's body we have here had deluges perhaps they may have suffered great conflagrations in jupiter 
how do we know to the contrary jupiter is ninety times bigger than the earth and turns on his one centre in ten hours whereas we don't turn in less than four and twenty which implies that his motion is two hundred and sixteen times stronger than ours may it not be possible that in so rapid a circulation its most dry and combustible parts should take fire as we see the axle trees in wheels from the force of motion will perfectly flame but however it is this light of jupiter is by no means comparable to another which in all probability is as ancient as the world and yet we have never seen it how does a light order it to be concealed says the countess there must be some singular address to compass this point this light replied i never appears but at twilight which is often strong enough to drown it and even when twilight suffers it to appear either the vapours of the horizon rob us of it or it is so very faint and hard to be perceived that for want of exactness in our knowledge we mistake it for the twilight but in short for these last fifteen years they have with much certainty distinguished it and it has been for some time the delight of the astronomers whose curiosity wanted waking by some novelty and they could not well have been more touched if they had discovered some new secondary planets the two latter moons of saturn for instance did not ravish them to that degree which the guards or moons of jupiter did but now we are fully accustomed to it we see one month before and after the vernal equinoctial when the sun's set and the twilight over a certain whitish light resembling the tail of a comet we see the same before sunrise and before the twilight towards the autumnal equinoctial and towards the winter solstice we see at night and morning except at these times it can't as i but now observed disengage itself from the twilights which are too strong and lasting for we suppose it to be a continued light and in all probability it is so we have begun to conjecture that it is produced from some prodigious quantity of matter crowded together which circles around the sun to a certain extent the greatest part of his rays pierce through his gross circuit and come down to us in a right line but some resting on the inner surface of this matter are from thence reflected to us and come with the direct rays or else we can't have them either morning or evening now as these reflected rays are shot from a greater height than those which are direct we must consequently have them sooner and keep them longer on this foot i must acquiesce in what i have already mentioned that the moon must have no twilight for want of being surrounded by such a gross air as the earth but she can be no loser her twilights will proceed from that kind of gross air which surrounds the sun and reflects his rays on places which his direct ones cannot reach but pray let me know says the countess are not their twilights settled for all the planets who will not need every one to be clothed with a distinct gross air because that which surrounds the sun alone may have one general effect for all the planets in the vortex i am mighty willing to think that nature agreeable to that inclination which i know she has to economy and good management should make that single means answer her purpose yet replied i notwithstanding that supposed economy she must have with respect to our earth two causes for twilight one whereof which is the thick air about the sun will be pretty useless and can only be an object of curiosity for the academy students but not to conceal anything it is possible that only the earth sends out from herself vapours and exhalations gross enough to produce twilights and that nature had reason to provide by one general means for the necessities of all the other planets which are if i may so say of a purer mould and their evaporations consequently more subtle we are perhaps those among all the inhabitants of the worlds in our vortex who required to have a more gross and thick air given us to breathe in with what contempt would the inhabitants of the other planets consider us if they knew this 
they would be out in their reasoning says the countess were not to be despised for being wrapped about with a thick air since the sun himself is so surrounded pray tell me is not this air produced by certain vapours which you have formerly told me issued from the sun and does it not serve to break the first force of his rays which had else probably been to excess i conceive that the sun may be veiled by nature to be more proportioned to our use well madam replied i this is some small opening to a system which you have started very happily we may add that these vapours may produce a kind of rain which falling back upon the sun may cool and refresh it as we sometimes throw water into a forge when the fire is too fierce there is nothing which we may not presume to help out nature's address but she has another kind of address very particular which is to conceal herself from us and we should not willingly be confident that we have found out her method of acting on her designs in it in case of new discoveries we should not be too importunate in our reasonings though we are always fond enough to do it and your true philosophers are like elephants who as they go never put their second foot to the ground till their first be well fixed the comparison seems the more just to me says she as the merit of those two species of animals elephants and philosophers does not at all consist in exterior agreements i am willing to mistake the judgment of both now teach me some of the latter discoveries and i promise you not to make any rash systems i'll tell you madam replied i all the news i know from the firmament and i believe the freshest advices you can have i am sorry they are not as surprising and wonderful as some observations which i read t'other day in an abridgment of the chinese annals written in latin and published lately they see a thousand stars at a time which fall from the sky into the sea with a prodigious noise or are dissolved and melt into rains and these are things which have been seen more than once in china i met with this observation at two several times pretty distant from each other without reckoning a certain star which goes eastward and bursts like a squib always with a great noise it is great pity that these sort of phenomena should be reserved for china and that our countries should never have their share of these sights it is not long since our philosophers thought they might affirm on good grounds that the heavens and all the celestial bodies were incorruptible and therefore incapable of change and yet at the same time there were other men in the other part of the earth who saw stars dissolve by thousands which must produce a very different opinion but says the countess did we ever hear it aloud that the chinese were such great astronomers tis true we did not says i but the chinese have an advantage from being divided from us by such a prodigious tract of earth as the greeks had over the romans by being so much prior in time distances of every sort pretend a right of imposing on us in reality i think still more and more that there is a certain genius which has never yet been out of the limits of europe or at least not much beyond them perhaps he may not permit it to spread over any great extent of the earth at once and that some fatality prescribes him very narrow bounds let us indulge him whilst we have him the best of it is he is not fettered up to the sciences and dry speculations but launches out with as much success into subjects of pleasure in which 